Welcome to the June 15th, 2022 regular meeting of the San Francisco Elections Commission. This meeting is being held in person at City Hall, room 408, 1 Dr. Carlton B. Goodlett Place, San Francisco, California, 94102, as authorized by California Government Code, section 54953E, and Mayor Breed's 45th supplement to her February 25th, 2020 emergency proclamation. It is possible that some members of the Elections Commission may attend this meeting remotely. In that event, those members will participate and vote by video. Members of the public may attend the meeting to observe and provide public comment at the physical meeting location listed above or online. Instructions for providing public comment are on the agenda. In addition to participating in real time, interested persons are encouraged to participate in this meeting by submitting public comment in writing by 12 p.m. on June 15, 2022 to Martha Delgadillo at sfgov.org. Uh, Secretary Delgadillo, uh, can you explain some procedures for today's remote and, and in-person meeting, please? Okay, thank you, Vice President Chapel. The minutes of this meeting will reflect that this meeting is being held in person at City Hall, room 4081, Dr. Carlton B. Goodlett Place, San Francisco, California, 94102. It is possible that some members of the Elections Commission may attend this meeting remotely. In addition to participating in real time, interested persons are encouraged to participate in this meeting by submitting public comment and writing by 12 p.m. on June 15, 2022, to Martha Delgadillo at sf.gov.org. It will be shared with the commission after this meeting has concluded and will be included as part of the official meeting file. Public the comment will be available on each item on this agenda. Each member of the public will be allowed three minutes to speak. Comments or opportunities to speak during the public comment period are available via phone call by calling 415-655-0001. Again, the phone number is 415-655-0001. Access code is 2490-282-8727. Again, 2490-282-8727, followed by the pound sign, and then press pound again to join as an attendee. You will hear a beep when you are connected to the meeting. You will be automatically muted and listening mode only. When your item of interest comes up, dial star three to raise your hand to be added to the public comment line. You will then hear you have raised your hand to ask a question. Please wait until the host falls on you. The line will be silent as you wait your turn to speak. Ensure you are in the quiet locations. Before you speak, mute the sound of any equipment around you, including television, radio, or computer. It is especially important that you mute your computer if you are watching via the web link to prevent feedback and echo when you speak. When the system message says your line has been unmuted, this is your turn to speak. You are encouraged to state your name clearly. Please spell it also. As soon as you begin speaking, you will have three minutes to provide your public comment. Six minutes if you are on the line with an interpreter. You will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you change your mind and wish to withdraw yourself from the, the public comment line, press star three again. You will hear the system say you have lowered your pen. When a phone is not available, you can use your computer web browser. Make sure the participant's side panel is showing by clicking on the participant's icon. Make sure the participant's panel is expanded in the side panel by pressing the small arrow in the gear. You should see a list of panelists followed by a list of attendees. At the bottom of the list of attendees is a small button or icon that looks like a hand. Press the hand icon to raise your hand. You will, you will be unmuted when it's time for you to comment. When you are done with your comment, click the hand icon again to lower your hand. Once your three minutes have expired, staff will thank you and mute you. You will hear your line has been muted. Public comment instructions are also listed on page five of the agenda. Thank you, Vice President Chapman. Great. Uh, with that, I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, Secretary Delgadillo, can you please proceed with the roll call? Sure. Uh, Vice President Chapel? Here. Commissioner Bernholz? Here. Commissioner Guy? Here. Commissioner Giordani? Here. And Commissioner Carroll? Present. 
present. Okay, with lunch is uh, present, we have the next one. Wonderful. All right, uh, before we get started, thank you to Commissioner Jordanik for filling in and sharing the last meeting. Uh, Commissioner Bernholt, thanks for joining remotely. I have eyes on you, so if you need anything, just let me know. Uh, okay, we'll start with the second agenda item, general public comment. Public comment on any issue within the Election Commission's general jurisdiction that is not covered by another item on this agenda. I uh, will start with those in attendance in person and then move on to those attending remotely. Uh, you'll have three minutes. Please state your name at the start. Do I need to turn a mic on or is it on? It's fine. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Hello, commissioners. Good evening. Um, my name is Brent Turner. I was uh, a volunteer. Uh, communications director for open voting consortium starting back in 2005 uh, around the time that this open source issue uh, became uh, first came in front of the commission and, and the county um, I wanted to make a comment uh, at the last meeting uh, Commissioner Bernholtz uh, with all due respect made a statement uh, casting what we call in the software community some fear, uncertainty, and doubt um, regarding open source software environments. Um, I uh, put in a note to the package that references the comment, but the comment may not be, not, may not be clear. At the risk of paraphrasing, I, I, I think the uh, commissioner mentioned that basically if an open source system was created, it is possible that people wouldn't show up to actually look at the code and therefore there may be a question as to the realities of the open source community. We just, as the public representing the open source community, we want to just highlight that statement and make sure that it's addressed uh, directly. Um, that line is what we call a throwaway line. That's been part of um, the Microsoft um, statement uh, toward open source. Um, you remember years back, you might have heard that Bill Gates accused the open source community of being communists. Um, well, another line um, is that open source is no panacea. If you ever hear anybody say that, that is certainly true as very few remedies are complete panaceas. So that's what we call a throwaway line. And this one as well, casting aspersion regarding uh, a possible lack of engagement by the open source community. Um, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, this this uh, commission has been great for years leading the country, the state, the country on this issue, and we want to make sure that we stand strong and and uh, don't have any misinformation entering the the picture, or at least as as little misinformation as possible. So thank you for your time, uh, Commissioner Bernholtz. Thank you, uh, Vice President Chappell. I'd like to respond to that. Um, it's a legitimate question. I don't appreciate the uh, uh, aspersions being uh, of, of association that are contained in that comment. It's not a question or a comment raised by any affiliation. I have none with Microsoft Corporation or any such others. And it's a well-known fact that open source software uh, is, many parts of open source software are solely dependent on the volunteer efforts of of well-intentioned, very diligent um, sustainers and maintainers who work very hard. Uh, it's also very true that the governance of open source software is as important as the code itself. So I am not speaking on anyone else's behalf. I'm simply raising a question. And I think it behooves this commission to be sure that both uh, decisions about code are made uh, in line with the commission's policy to pursue open source software, but to never ever uh, uh, pretend that open source software is a silver bullet. It's not a panacea and it must be uh, paid uh, great attention to the governance of that software and to in fact make sure that people do uh, take the opportunity to review the code and maintain the code. And to raise that question is to simply do my job. It is not to affiliate myself with any organization or any others who may have um, somehow uh, uh, earned uh, Mr. Turner's disregard. 
it is a legitimate question being asked with legitimate concern for the uh, free, fair, and functional elections of the commission. And I don't appreciate any other uh, allegations or um, hints. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bernholtz. Uh, I don't see any other public commenters in the room. So, Martha, can you please move on to those um, attending remotely? Sure. First caller on the to comment. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Great, it's David Pilpel. I have uh, no general public comment, just a technical issue. I could hear the commissioners, including Commissioner Bernholz on uh, WebEx. I could not hear uh, Martha. So if Martha could pull her microphone over and be sure that the mic is on so that it's all uh, uh, piping through the audio, that would be great. And it was can very important stuff and I wanted to hear it. So anyway, uh, <laughs> that, that's all for now. You'll hear from me more later. Thanks. Can you hear me, David? I, I can. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, bye. Next caller, oh, Mr. Rothman, I'm going to unmute you. You will have three minutes to comment. Okay, thank you. My name is Richard Rothman, and this might be a little outside your, well, I'm gonna propose it anyway. You know, it was in reference to Proposition C on the ballot that Supervisor Peskin uh, since we seem to be in the recall uh, mode now for and how to the replacements. And I don't think the mayor should do the replacements. And I was thinking since the, the commissioners are each appointed separately by an elected official, the same as the ethics commission, that maybe either your commission or the ethics commission could interview and, and appoint a replacement. And this way it would be seem more fair since each of you represent a different elected official and it's too late to put it on the ballot now, but uh, it's just something to think about. Um, you know, the people who were against C were uh, very adamant that uh, uh, they wanted uh, the person could run again for uh, the office. And if you wanna do that, fine. But I just think we need a more uh, simpler and fair way to uh, to appoint a person who's recall. And if you want them to run again, you can say that or not, but uh, it's something to think about. And thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. We have no other callers um, with their hands raised. Okay. Great. Uh, then we will move on to agenda item number three. Discussion and possible action on resolution on continuation of remote elections commission meetings. Uh, the resolution is in the packet. I'm not going to reread it at this meeting. Can I have a motion? from someone on the commission. I move that we approve the motion in the packet. Second. Second. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. Can we go to public comment? Yes. Yes. There's no one in person. Anyone on the phone? No, I don't see any hands raised. Okay. Let's take the vote. Okay. So, uh, Vice President Chapel, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Bernholz? Yes. Commissioner Dye? Aye. Commissioner Giordani? Yes. And Commissioner Shapiro? Yes. Okay, with five votes in the affirmative, it passes. Wonderful. Okay. Moving on to agenda item number four election of commission executive officers. Discussion and possible action to elect a commission president and vice president if needed. Per Article 5 of the commission bylaws, per the bylaws, the term shall begin immediately at the conclusion of the meeting. Uh, first, let me say thank you to Commissioner Bernholtz for her year and a half of service and leadership as, as former president. Uh, your guidance has been instrumental uh, personally and to the commission. 
Uh, the procedure is set out in the agenda. I'm going to open nominations for president now. Uh, anyone who wishes to nominate a candidate or nominate themselves can state their name. I will start by saying that I am more than happy to serve as president. Um, so, if anyone else would like a stab in it, throw your name out into the ring. No? I nominate you. Okay. <laughs> Um, and, right. and note for the public's information that we don't have succession written in into our bylaws. So that's right. So there is no automatic ascension. <laughs> ascension. Okay. Um, Anna, do we take a do we take public comment or just a? We need a second, I think. Oh, do we need a second? Oh, okay. Second. A second. Okay. Should we do before vice president now and then? Public comment, or should we do it individually? Do it together. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so then similarly, do we have any nominations for vice president? Or we should do the vote for President Christian. I think we're gonna. Oh, were you saying that we do public comment together, or were you saying we do the vote together? So we can do nominations for VP, then take public comment, then they do those two separate votes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so any nominations or self nominations for vice president? I nominate Commissioner Jordanic for vice president. And are you willing to serve? Um, thank you. Sure, I'll serve. Thank you, Commissioner Day. And I would also nominate Commissioner Shapiro if she would be interested. So, yes. Okay. So we have two. Um, okay. So then we will take public comment on both uh, president and vice president, and then we'll move on to votes. Uh, okay. I think we have a uh, commenter in person. Hello, Commissioners Brent Turner, um, supporting um, the both nominations of, uh, uh, I believe, Commissioner Chapel and Commissioner Jordanic. Thank you. And no further commenters in person. So, Mark, if you can move on to those attending remotely. Okay, so we do have one caller with their hand raised. I will unmute you, caller, and you have three minutes to comment. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, David Pilpo again. I moved over to the computer this time. Um, so when the question was put about the procedure and DCA Flores opined, I could not hear her comment. So when she has something to say, you got to share the microphone, please, please, please. Um, I certainly uh, support the, the the divided question here on on Vice President Chapel. I'm I'm sure she'll do a fine job, uh, and I'm choosing not to weigh in on um, the the Vice President uh, candidates. Both uh, commissioners, here Donnie and Shapiro, either way would do a fine job. Anyone who's willing to put in the time at this point to try to you know keep the the ship afloat uh, is is fine by me. So. Um, thank you for listening. I'll later. Thank you, Mr. Popa. We don't have any. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. So, first, we'll do the vote for president. So, uh, <laughs> since there's only one, you'll just say, I guess, yes or no. Okay. So, Martha, can you take the, the vote, please? So, just to be clear, we're voting for president now. For okay. For myself as president. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, Vice President Chapel, how do you how do you vote? Yes. Okay. Commissioner Bernholz. Yes. Commissioner Dye. Yes. 
Commissioner Jordanik? Yes. And Commissioner Shapiro? Yes. Okay, with five votes in the affirmative, it passes. The motion passes. Okay, now for vice president, uh, your vote will be for either uh, Commissioner Jordanik or Commissioner Shapiro. And uh, if someone has four votes, they will be elected. If not, we will do another vote. <laughs> okay, Martha. Can you do another pass? Yes, yeah, so now you'll ask us, we'll each vote. Oh, okay, for, I see. Yeah. Okay, so Vice President Chapel, do you vote for uh, Commissioner Jordanik or Commissioner Shapiro? Commissioner Shapiro. And uh, Commissioner Bernholz? Commissioner Shapiro. Commissioner Dye? Commissioner Jordanik. Commissioner Jordanik. Um, Commissioner Jordanik. And Commissioner Shapiro. Commissioner Shapiro. Okay, so with three affirmative <laughs> for Commissioner Shapiro. Okay, no. So and two for Commissioner Jordanik. To... Oh, we have to do. So this is DCA Flores. The bylaws do call for. Is there an echo? No. The by the commission's bylaws call for a majority vote. Um, so a majority vote would be four. Right. So we we need four total votes. No one, neither of the two. Neither of the four two total votes. So we can talk and then yes, we'll take a revote. Yes. Okay. So, Commissioner Jordanik, your your history of service with the commission is is well documented and exemplary. My reasoning for voting for Commissioner Shapiro was simply because you're getting close to the end of your term, and I thought it would be helpful to have someone who could potentially do multiple years, since it's typically a multi-year kind of role. So that was my thinking. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to provide any thought, uh, kind of any reasoning behind their votes. So my reasoning was actually to go with experience because I believe um, the terms are actually one year, if, if I recall. They're one year terms. Yeah. Practice has typically been kind of two years, but at least while I've been on here and, and yeah. kind of what I was told going into it. So as someone who's come from a very public commission that rotated leadership, um, you know, I, I I see no reason why we have to make the term longer than a year. Um, it's a one year term according to our bylaws and I uh, think given the uh, um, the disruption that we've had in the last few meetings that it would be useful to have experience and I think there'll be opportunities for everyone to serve. So that was my reason. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Is the term until January 1st or is it until a year from today? That's a good question. Yeah. It's both of them, really. Yeah. What was the answer? I lost maybe silent on that. Right. I think, so I think, I, I think we can decide, actually. I think the bylaws say that they're elected every January. Um, so that that is what the bylaws say. However, um, in a situation of vacancy, the bylaws are silent about whether that restarts the clock uh, or whether that would be because technically if they if you're up in January, that would be two terms you're serving, right? Um, so the bylaws are silent on that and the commission may amend the bylaws to clarify that um, in the future. But since they are silent, uh, I would definitely probably go with whatever your bylaws do state. Which is every January. Okay. So yeah. we can assume this is a six month term essentially. Yeah, and just to clarify, my term ends in a year and a half, so I I still have plenty of time to like serve a full term. Of... I would say that just for consistency with bylaws that we make it a six month term and Yep. Agreed. And you know, we can choose to rotate. So okay. I will say um, I'm I appreciate the 
um, recognition and um, also just trust um, from Commissioner Bernholtz and, uh, or sorry, yes, Commissioner Bernholtz and Vice President slash President um, <laughs> Chapel. Um, and also, I think Commissioner Jardonic obviously would be phenomenal as well. Um, I have a lot of passion and energy for this commission, regardless um, of my capacity, though I do have a lot of desire to come in and roll my sleeves up, whether it's vice president or continuing as a commissioner. But I would be privileged and humbled to help get a fresh start with what is now, I think, majority of a new group of people. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to potentially have that. Um, and just in defense of my own nomination, I've, as has been mentioned, I've been serving for about eight and a half years, and I'm proud to say that I've only missed a single meeting during that time. And um, I think I was only late only once, but um, I have been vice president twice before and also president twice before. And um, I also do a lot of support behind the scenes and supporting the secretary and helping incoming presidents. And I'm happy to help, um, you know, educate people on, on how the process works. But I would be honored to just serve a little bit more in my past, in my last year and a half, because the last time I served as an officer was, um, I think it was like five years ago or so. Thanks. I'm happy to support you on that. Um, I perhaps can work with you on learning more of the ropes so that in six months, perhaps we can talk and explore what um, that might look like in the future. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we will take a revote unless uh, Commissioner Bernholtz, you have anything to add? Okay, an expressive face. All right, so should we take public comment? Nope, uh, we've already taken public comment, so we'll just do another revote. Okay, so um, President, Vice, uh, Vice Pre President, whatever President elect. <laughs> How do you vote? Uh, Commissioner Jordanic. Okay, uh, Commissioner Bernholz? Commissioner Jordanic. Commissioner Dye? Commissioner Jordanic. Commissioner Jordanic? Uh, Commissioner Jordanic. And Commissioner Shapiro. Commissioner Giordani. So that gives the majority. Motion passes. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you Congratulations. To Commissioner Giordanic. Look forward to serving with you, uh, passing the torch. Uh, all right. So uh, we'll move on to agenda item number five approval of minutes of previous meetings. Discussion and possible action on the minutes of the commission's February 14, 2022 regular meeting and April 6, 2022 special meetings. Uh, so I had already given Martha a heads up. Uh, I just had two minor items. Uh, one voting works is one word. Uh, so it's in, yes, I'd like to. Uh, uh, amend the current draft and correct voting works name. Uh, and also, if we could change motion to moved, <laughs> it would appear twice in items uh, it's okay. four and five. Otherwise, it looked good. Typos. It's minor okay. typos. Okay. Otherwise, it looked good. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Dye. Um, unless there's any other comments from the commission, we'll go on to public comment. Nope. Okay. No one in person. So Martha, can you go to public comments? Sure. Um, I'm going to unmute you, caller. Um, I'm sure this is Mr. Bill Pell. It is David Bill Pell. <laughs> hope you can. Hope you can hear me. Okay. Uh, so just to uh, follow up for uh, one second on the uh, previous issue, since there wasn't a second opportunity for uh, public comment, uh, perhaps. Uh, in her new capacity as president, uh, uh, President Chapel will review the uh, members of BOPEC and maybe Commissioner Shapiro could be arm twisted into serving on or sharing <laughs> BOPEC. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. 
Um, as to the minutes, I would note that they were only posted yesterday. I haven't had a whole lot of time to go over them. There were a couple of things that I noticed uh, right off the bat on the February uh, minutes. The uh, header at the top left um, doesn't align with the uh, membership of the commission uh, at that time. I believe that was either Commissioner Mogi's last uh, meeting or second to last, and uh, uh, Member Dye was not yet a member of the commission in uh, February. So that should be uh, aligned. And there was some other stuff about spelling and whatnot and both that. Anyway, I'm happy to uh, do a, a pass on the uh, minutes if you want to approve them uh, tonight with the understanding that uh, non-substantive um, uh, edits can be uh, made um, by the commission secretary with the approval of, I don't know, President Chapel or somebody, uh, or uh, it could be uh, both sets could be put it off again. But I, I think it would be really helpful in the future to have the minutes available when the other documents are posted. So it's not like on 24 hours that we have to. And if they're not ready, they're not ready. And I recognize that it took hours and hours to go through that uh, big meeting with the hundreds of speakers and the and it's just yeah. So the, the good news is that we have minutes that reflect the record of what happened at the meeting. The bad news is it takes a while to get there, but we should get there and do it right. Just like counting ballots, we should get the right answer, not the fast answer. So take all of that for, for what you will. Thanks for listening. And thank you, Martha and everybody. Thank you. So just for the record, um, I was actually appointed on February 10th. So I actually was a commissioner as of that meeting on February. Um, and I had sent a bunch of um, edits for the April meeting. Some of them were substantive, so I wonder if we should wait on the April ones. I think we'll wait on April 6th. That's also longer, so I'm sure members of the public will have a little bit longer to do. On mm -hmm. February 14th, it sounds like we are substantively in agreement. We have some minor formatting and kind of typographical changes. So uh, I would think that we would feel comfortable approving those minutes with, uh, you know, subject to those changes, which Martha and I will make together. Um, if, if any commissioner is comfortable with that and wants to move, that would be great. So moved, I move that we approve the February 14th, 2022 draft minutes. Second. Perfect. Uh, and we have taken public comment on this item. So, Martha, can you go to a vote, please? Okay. Vice President, I'm sorry. President Chapel, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Bernholz? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Dye, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Vice President Jordanik, how do you vote? Yes. And Commissioner Shapiro, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. So, five in the affirmative. The motion passes. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, moving on to item number six, Dominion Voting Systems contract extension, discussion and possible action regarding the extension period for the city and county of San Francisco's contract with Dominion Voting Systems. Uh, Commissioner Jordanik, do you want to intro this item? Sure. Um, thank you, President Chapel. Um, so this is an item that we've discussed a few times before, and at the last meeting we um, did not discuss it because uh, you were away and we um, didn't have a chance to sit down with you. But since the last meeting, um, we did have a chance to sit down and just discuss the resolution. And um, so the resolution draft that's a part of the packet today is basically the same as what was presented, or I should say attached to the packet of the last meeting with the exception of a clause at the very end that's double underlined. And this was a way of addressing Director Arnes's concern that he expressed two meetings ago that he was wanted to make sure that he wasn't up against a deadline in the last year and not having a voting system. So just basically expressing that we support ensuring that the department has a voting system in place like well in advance of that election um, 
that would follow that second year extension. So, um, President Chapel, did you want to say anything else about the resolution? Yeah, uh, thank you, Commissioner Jordanik, and thank you for for working on the draft of this and in, in a couple of different formats. Uh, I think this addressed some of the concerns that were raised when it was initially brought up about, uh, you know, not including anything that would kind of be a message we didn't want to send about a system that we would in fact be using. Um, and I think it also adds that language kind of in deference to Director Arntz and what he needs to accomplish from a kind of operational perspective. I think the one, uh, the two clauses that uh, Commissioner Jordanik and I talked a little bit about, and I would kind of specifically raise to the commission, are on page two, uh, the whereas clauses at, at line 10 and line 14. Um, I think we both, you know, we have not made any kind of, res uh, you know, statement about those comments made by the Dominion sales rep. We've grappled with that a bit. Um, I don't think it's misplaced in this resolution, but I don't necessarily think it's necessary in this resolution. So I think question, you know, a more specific question of the commission is how we feel about those items and, you know, whether we want to retain them uh, if we do ultimately approve this resolution. Could I just add one comment on that? Absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah, and I did, we did discuss this together when we sat down and um, I can kind of go either way on it. I feel like it's like President Chapel said, it's not totally necessary, but at the same time, if we do include it, I feel like that may be adequate response to um, to kind of close that issue. Whereas if we don't include it, I feel like it seems like we we still need to do something more with respect to that. Um, you know, resolving that kind of outstanding issue. So I feel like if it's in there, then we can kind of set this aside. We've stated this on the record. But if it's not in there, then we kind of need to do something more, I think. I think that's an excellent point. So I, I would support leaving it in then. Okay, I didn't know other comments then. Uh, do we have any motions? Okay, well, I move that we adopt the resolution as revised in the packet. Do you have a second? Second. Okay, great. And we'll move on to public comments. Uh, I think we'll have a commenter in public. Hello, Commissioners, Brent Turner, and thanks for indulging me. Um, some of these comments uh, seem to get redundant, but for the sake of clarity within the record, I just want to mention that the public supports um, this uh, move ahead by the commission, and and um, I, I just want to sort of re recap a little um, what happened here for those that might not be clear. Um, it's not that we're, anybody is picking on Dominion in particular. Um, the problem is, is that all three major companies that control the United States voting system market um, are operating on outdated software. So we're, we're dealing with a company that not only is selling something to us that is outdated, they're also price gouging at the same time. On top of that, they're making comments through their representative, Steve Bennett, uh, public comments that this commission is ignorant which is offensive, and that San Francisco voters don't care about elections, which is also incorrect and, and offensive. Um, they have been uh, very, very uh, forward in mentioning that John Arnst and the Department of Elections are Dominion's well-oiled machine. And, and I think all these statements taken together um, deserve a response, and I've noted that Steve Bennett nor Dominion has decided to come forward and come here and defend anything, any of these statements. Um, we're thick-skinned, and and you know this wouldn't be the 
the the uh, end of the world, just these statements. But the the problem for Dominion is now that whereas before we were trying to have the government create an open source system, now a nonprofit has come along, uh, Voting Works, and is willing to give effort here right on point. So we're just hopeful that again this commission sticks with the tradition for the past 14 15 years of leading the state and the country on this issue and and stand strong and does not give dominion any benefit of any doubt when it comes to contract um, as i think commissioner jordanic has been leading in pointing out there are ways to manicure the contract to best position the county rather than give in to dominion thank you Commissioner Bernholtz. Oh, we can't hear you, Commissioner Bernholtz. Thanks. I don't know if you want to finish public comment before my comment. Okay. That's fine. Uh, we'll move on to public comment from those attending remotely. Okay, so we do have one caller on the line. I believe it's Mr. Phil Powell. Okay. You are unmuted and you have three minutes to comment. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, just reading the document. I'm assuming that uh, the motion is to approve the resolution with the uh, changes. So, for example, line two would strike, uh, uh, sorry, page two would strike lines one through nine and make the other uh, changes. Um, I am assuming that's correct. I am not particularly concerned with the re whereas clauses, just the two resolve clauses on page uh, three. Um, the first resolve clause that the commission supports extending, I assume that that is merely stating the commission's policy. The commission can um, determine its policy, but not direct the director in a particular way with respect to contracts that are under his um, sole jurisdiction. Um, and in the final resolve, requesting the board to extend the contract only one year this year. I'm not sure if the one year contract extension um, would require board approval under charter section 9.118. Um, that uh, turns in part on the amount of uh, money involved in the length of time. So um, I don't know if uh, BCA floor is uh, way in on that. Um, but I think, uh, as I say, that it's important that the commission state clearly what its policy is and let the rest of the process run uh, however it runs without uh, running into the non-interference uh, clause of the uh, charter with respect to uh, contracts and day-to-day -day administration of the department. It gets a little tricky and um, perhaps a little guidance might help. Um, thanks for listening. More later. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised. Okay, uh, Commissioner Bernholtz. Did, uh, thank you. Does um, DCA Flores want to chime in on Mr. Pilpel's question? So uh, we don't provide legal advice to the members of the public. Um, however, if the commission has a question, uh, you can ask it and I can respond. Well, let me ask it then. I mean, um, I want to, first of all, thank uh, president elect chapel and, and uh, vice president Jordanic for working on this. I think, I do think it's, in, it's important, um, but it sends messages in a, in a variety of different ways. And I think it's very important that this commission at the very least acknowledge that we are cognizant of and attentive to the very poisoned information atmosphere around the country right now. Um, about Dominion software uh, that's being used in a variety of ways by a variety of players with a variety of motives and that um, signals that we may be wanting to send to a company may w easily be captured by those we're not intending to single signal anything to or perhaps we are I don't I don't think we are um, but I we uh, I personally find it this a very difficult choice because um, what we're all we're really able to do here is is uh, send a signal of displeasure. Um, 
I don't believe uh, the commission, I, I believe the, the, the resolution as it stands backs the commission away from interfering with Director Arntz's sole responsibility. However, um, it does also uh, override in some ways. It sends a signal that we still wanted to say this regardless of what the director told us about what he needs. Um, so we're sending a lot of signals. I'm not sure we're accomplishing anything. And I want to again reiterate that we cannot be certain how signals get picked up and read and used or misused. So the question from me to you, DCA Flores, is does this um, stand firmly on the side of the non-interference line uh, between the commission and Director Arntz's responsibilities? One second. Uh, so, in terms of violating the non interference clause, um, I don't believe that this um, resolution does so because it simply is a request to the board of supervisors. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, weigh in just briefly um, to support what. Um, Commissioner Bernholtz had mentioned, um, which is part of why I felt kind of strongly when we talked about this, probably my first meeting about the Raffensperger case um, and removing that component. Um, and I do think that the, while Dominion may not be considered by some members of the public or commission um, to be the ideal solution, it is the system we're working with now. And I agree that there is a lot of misinformation and um, honestly malice intended misinformation surrounding the voting system. And I agree that we are dancing, we're, we're playing a fine line between um, ensuring that we're maintaining the integrity of the system that we're currently using and while striving to hold accountable. So I think if I guess one question I have is, I think Commissioner Jardonic, you had said that you felt that, or sorry, Vice President Jardonic, you perceived that this, that the section needed to remain in the resolution because it put closure in some capacity to the issue of the, um, uh, to the issue. Um, and so do you feel that Without incorporating the, that specific piece, you, I think you had expressed some desire to do something else. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so, but before I answer that question, I just want to make very clear that this resolution is not, it's not, its goal is not to signal displeasure with Dominion. It's more, it's about acting in consistency with our open source policy. And that's that's why the, the resolution leads with the open source. So the, the thing about what the, and there's nothing negative in here about Dominion as a, a company or about, about their voting system. The only thing that's negative in here is the thing that the Dominion sales representative said. So I think it's kind of secondary to what this resolution is trying to achieve, which is all it is is just to renew the contract one year. But um, I was thinking that the reason to include in the first place, because it, I think it is relevant, but um, at the same time, it's not necessary. But in terms of bringing closure, and this wasn't just me, but it was as a, as a body, I think a lot of us over the past several months have said we needed to do something more given that he did not respond to the letter that um, President at the time Bernholtz wrote to him. And um, so I, th I think it's not just me, but I feel like as a body or individuals on this body felt that 
we had some like on something more that we had to do to um, acknowledge or respond to the fact that he did not, um, you know, reply to our letter asking him for an explanation. Thank you for clarifying. I mean, if he didn't say it, he should tell us that, you know, for example, but I think the reason I asked, um, and I agree I from the. From the revisions of the resolution, I do think that open source source voting is the primary. Um, kind of, I think it's the primary rationale. I think just the inclusion of this piece. Um, uh, I agree that. It is concerning and there, that there was no response, though. If if the primary focus is around open source voting, it seems kind of an arbitrary piece to include in the resolution and perhaps would might be beneficial to have a separate. Um, it, and I actually, I don't have like particularly strong feelings. It's more just for the purposes of dialogue of whether this is the right. Forum to. Um, elevate that, and that's why I'd asked about alternatives, um, because the quote in the newspaper that we don't have additional information on because it wasn't responded to as a rationale for not extending a contract. I just am not sure if that is really as crucial as really the emphasis on the open source voting. Okay, if we did, can I just ask if we did remove it, and this is a question to everyone, if we did remove it, would people want to revisit that at a future meeting on, on how to proceed with that? Yeah, I think we've, this has come up in a number of meetings and we've kept deferring it. And I think, you know, we, my sense of what the commission has felt is that there should be some response, but we haven't really figured out what to do. I think in part because we are so sensitive to the issue that uh, Commissioner Bernholtz has raised that we don't want to send a a message that could be misappropriated in some way. Um, as it relates to this resolution, you know, part of what we talked about before, part of why. You know, I got more comfortable with it was because we were really focusing on preserving optionality to move to a system that was in line with our mission statement, more so than moving away from a system that we did not like or did not think worked. Because in reality, that is the system we're going to be using and we have used and we've approved those elections. And so I think. To some extent, having these two whereas clauses muddies the water a little bit because it does talk about kind of dominion. On the other hand, if your vendor disparages you in the real world, that is very much a reason to reconsider your relationship. So I don't think that's not kind of relevant for the purposes of a contract extension. But, you know, I. I think maybe given how much kind of heartburn we're having up here about this, it might make sense to take it out of this resolution and then again, consider how to revisit the, uh, the issue with the dominion rep, just because it, it doesn't seem like we're, and I don't want to speak for anyone else, but just kind of the reaction I'm seeing here is that, you know, this is maybe muddying the waters a little bit of what the purpose of the resolution is. Can I just add one additional thing, um, which is, I agree that the disparaging of the. The relationship is a is a problem, but it is 1 sales representative and it's not to say it's not problematic, but I don't think that that is. As I just, I would almost encourage a, a 2nd letter or a 2nd statement that is. Kind of a supplement to the resolution that the resolution is primarily focused on the technology and or the software and the the rationale behind that and then a secondary piece that is expressly stating discontent with the not only the sales representatives lack of response but the organizational lack of response um, and that that did not that was not um, that did not bode well in the 
decision making of the contract, but it wasn't a deciding factor. Because it isn't, I, I didn't, my perception of the last several months was that wasn't a deciding factor, it's the open source voting that is. And so to just have those be cleanly separated might be beneficial. But I'm, I'm open, I, it's just something for discussion. So I just, you know, honestly, I could go either way on this because I do think this is intended to be an, an affirmative resolution restating the commission's policy in support of open source voting and making sure that we allow room for that uh, and not make um, decisions that are inconsistent with our stated policy. Um, however, if we pull this out, it might make it a bigger deal. I mean, then it might really seem like there's an anti dominion piece here. Um, so that's what I struggle with because on the one hand, just like ma making statements of fact in this document in a whereas clause, not in a resolve clause, right? Um, just to provide context, it's like, it seems, you know, like as Chris said, we could let it lie. Um, if we pull it out, it, I wonder if it makes it a bigger deal than we want it to. So, and by pulling it out, you mean pulling it out and making it its own separate thing. That That's a standalone, on. Yeah, yeah, item that it, it it perhaps raises it to a level that, you know, we don't want to raise it to. That that's my only concern, I, but I do understand your point that it, you know, there's a lot of stuff in here, right? That's why we took some other stuff out, <laughs> but. Uh, um, it isn't irrelevant, right? I mean, if you're talking about a different system, whether it be open source or another proprietary system, you kind of have to talk about the system that you have. So, so, and I think it's fairly, it's factual statements. I mean, there was a newspaper article and President Burns did write a letter that was not responded to. So it's a statement of facts. I feel like if we made it a standalone thing, it would just, perhaps be, like I said, make it a bigger deal. I don't know, how do you feel, Commissioner Gernonic, having thought about this some more? Well, I mean, like I said earlier, I can go either way, and I think um, I support a lot of the comments that everyone has been making, so I would kind of defer to um, Commissioner Bernholtz and Commissioner Shapiro, like what, what would you like to do on this? I think, I, I think that's, it's kind of, yeah, that's kind of the point. Like if we remove it, then do people, do we really want to revisit it at a future meeting? And then, um, yeah, is that going to make it a bigger thing? But, um, I mean, I can go either way. I just, I would like to see, hear what so the you like. I, Commissioner Bernholtz, I, I, from my memory of your letter, um, which to be fair, I read months ago, um, we already expressly stated, and I think all of you would recall that it was inappropriate and disrespectful. Um, and so that would just be repeating something that was already included. It seems like the only new piece that we would be stating is that there was no response from Dominion. Is that correct? That has been noted in prior minutes or it should have been. Yeah. Because I, I, I can go about, I can go both ways, but I'm curious if you have any shift in your perspective after this conversation. Sorry. I, I, yeah, I, I don't, I, 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 like everyone else find this to be a, a lot of, um, a, a lot of very, uh, important attention, um, to a document that I'm not sure, um, can or will bear the weight we're putting on it. Um, but I don't think. I think I agree with, uh, I, I do agree with Commissioner Jordanik's first comment that um, keeping it in here um, attends to it. 
I don't know if it puts that particular issue to bed, but it attends to it. And um, I think the document actually does a good job of framing this as being about open source. Agreed. And and that that's our that's our uh, that's the horizon we're aiming for. So I, I would lean toward leaving it in. Let's leave it in. Okay. I think then we're ready to take a vote. Okay. Secretary Delgadillo. Okay. Um, President Chapel, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Bernholz? Yes. Commissioner Dye? Aye. Vice President Jordanic? Yes. And Commissioner Shapiro? Yes. Okay, with five in the affirmative, it passes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, moving on. Item number seven, redistricting process initiative, discussion and possible action regarding the commission's potential recommendations with respect to the San Francisco redistricting process, including historical background in the proposed project plan. Um, for the purposes of this agenda item, we're elevating Stephen Hill and Julia Marks to panelists who are both in person. Um, so they'll not be restricted by the public comment, uh, time constraints. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to commissioner Shapiro and commissioner die who are kind of spearheading this part of the process. I'll let you give introduction and kind of introduce your guests. Sure. Um. So uh, after I uh, put this item on the agenda for our last meeting, the commission directed uh, uh, me and Commissioner Shapiro to uh, hatch a plan on how we might have this um, public forum and discussion on how to improve San Francisco's redistricting process. Uh, so we subsequently put our heads together and uh, Commissioner Shapiro um, kindly wrote up our, our notes here uh, which is posted in the packet as the first item, uh, which we're calling the uh, uh, redistricting initiative. Um, and what we wanted to do is uh, hopefully agree on objectives and, and deliverables. Uh, and we, ha we have proposed a general approach that uh, uh, we didn't want to um, uh, put too many uh, boundaries on this, um, but we did uh, kind of organize the, the different aspects of the redistricting process into kind of categories. Uh, and then we left open uh, at the bottom of this document, you'll see um, uh, discussion about what the timeline should actually be. Uh, if there are speakers, the commission would like to hear from. Uh, any thoughts on public outreach and engagement and what a final deliver may or may not look like. And I will say that we don't have to decide on that right now. Um, there's also uh, some deadlines coming up that may push the deadline in terms of um, ballot initiatives that might go on the November ballot. So um, there may be external events that may push us one way or the other. <laughs> um, Commissioner Shapiro, do you want to run through this really quickly, and then we can invite our our uh, guests to speak and address the commission? Sure, the comprehensive, yes, yeah. or just the approach. Um, go through the document however you feel would be most helpful. <laughs> sure. Um, really, the goal, the kind of overview of this is just to follow up on the attention that was brought to the redistricting process um, earlier this year and offer a public forum for education, dialogue, and strategic recommendations from various stakeholders, but um, predominantly the public and independent advocacy groups. Um, and we really wanted to lay out a clear objective where we can look at the current process and explore the alternatives to um, procedures from the comprehensive, holistic uh, process from pick 
qualifying uh, candidates outreach uh, for the task force to their actual processes their when they are uh, what kind of trainings they're required to do to the actual mapping and drafting process and um, community feedback. Um, and then potentially, um, depending on where we land from all of the feedback, um, informing a memorandum or as Commissioner Dai mentioned, a uh, charter amendment. Um, initially, we had discussed that this initiative may be a six month process, um, though depending on many um, considerations, it could extend longer um, and it is a joint undertaking by all members of the elections commission, although um, commissioner die has extensive experience in redistricting um, and I did support the uh, general approach and initiative plan. Um, this will be a joint initiative amongst all members and we encourage the public to participate in the process. Um, we may also call special meetings um, as needed, um, as we may need to spend additional time to have uh, discussions specifically related to subject matter of, around redistricting. Um, as I mentioned, um, we're going to allow space to examine the holistic redistricting process and thinking about this in kind of five buckets. Um, first, looking at the task force member composition um, and um, Commissioner Dai put together a really helpful uh, review of best practices, um, kind of a high level understanding of what San Francisco redistricting process looks like and then um, what other independent commissions um, or task forces processes are and how they differ. And so um, I, that kind of informed some of these um, these buckets, though please know um, this is not set in stone. So type, sorry, type is an independent body of citizens um, or um, open to other discussion. The structure of the task force, so um, the size, uh, currently we're at nine, um, perhaps it would be larger depending on the need. Um, and also the process of alternates, um, which became a topic of conversation over the last process when we were asked to uh, consider the, the circumstances with our own appointees and what would happen should anything change with our appointees, what that process should be to ensure um, it's free and fair. Um, how candidates for the task force are recruited, um, the timing, the channels, candidate pool, and ensuring that is broad and inclusive, but also that they are well represented. So qualifications for task force members, um, ensuring that uh, our communities who are most marginalized are incorporated in, in the process and included from an equity perspective. Um, and then also the selection criteria and vetting conditions. So really trying to minimize any sort of political um, influence or special interest influence. And then onboarding is really just what is the process once task force members have been selected? Um, how are they preparing? What is the staffing and support? The tactical planning? How is that developed consistent to best practices and not just the kind of um, discretion of whomever is on the task force? Um, and then criteria, this is a big, uh, may, may require a big component of the process, the initiative, um, even though it's the smallest bullet on the approach. And that is because um, there is a very thin, um, there are very thin requirements as it pertains to, not thin, but um, let's say light. Um, outline of the criteria required for redistricting and um, trying to evaluate what is the best approach um, and what criteria we should be using to determine, or excuse me, how a task force should determine what a draft map and boundary outlines should, should be. Um, and then the operation. So once the, the, the process of redistricting is going into effect, um, what is that public outreach process? 
who, who are they reaching out to? What is the procedural mapping process? What is the voting process? And how is, um, how are all of those components um, documented? Um, and then accountability and transparency, which was a big issue in this most recent um, uh, process is the public input and the decision making processes uh, the communications between commission commissioners um, and other political members. Um, and then also looking at member replacement and recourse if there's, for example, a deadline that's broken or um, there is some sort of misconduct. Um, these are kind of the key elements of accountability and transparency that we proposed our talking points um, for the commission to consider as we think about improving the integrity and fairness of the um, redistricting process. Commissioner Dye, did I miss anything? No, I think that was very complete. Um, I wanted to invite other commissioners to ask questions or if there are any thoughts on this proposal before we ask some of our invited guests to give us some historical context. Uh, Commissioner Bernholtz. Yeah, thank you. And I want to thank both commissioners, Diane Shapiro for your work on this. I do have at this point, um, I mean, I'll have several questions. Um, but I do have. 1 question about scope uh, that goes actually to the use of the word holistic, which appears several times in the document. Um, although I'm not always sure correctly. Um, I think it's important. If we proceed in any direction like this to put boundaries about this. And I would argue that um, given that it is uh, a question that San Francisco voters like to revisit, um, which is whether or not we should have districts at all, um, <laughs> that uh, we, we uh, bound this in such a way that it is focused on redistricting in a system that has district supervis supervisors and that we actually um, don't open ourselves up to every possible question that could be brought before a group like this. So I'm not sure if that's, um, I I'm confused by the frequent use of the word holistic in here. And so I should ask both the commissioners, Diane Shapiro, if, if you meant to open it beyond, beyond that. Um, well, if, if, if it's not clearly stated, um, there are, are eager members of the public, uh, members of the public quite eager to, to reopen that decision, which I think is beyond the purview of what you've described here. Yeah, so I think that uh, when we were talking about holistic, I think we meant that although we kind of bucketed this out into five different categories that they can't be considered in isolation. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, the size of the commission impacts the voting uh, mm -hmm. requirements, um, you, you know, and the selection process uh, informs how you might remove or replace the commissioner. So even though those are in separate buckets that uh, at we're, we kind of broke it down so we could, um, you know, kind of do a deep dive on these uh, in a in a logical way. But at the end, we'll have to, you know, put it back together again, so to speak, uh, in a holistic framework that might be a series of recommendations that would form a charter amendment. Um, so I think that that was the primary reason for holistic, uh, as opposed to completely opening up the question of whether we should have districts or not. Would you agree, Commissioner Shimpero? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and I really appreciate that perspective, um, Commissioner Bernholtz. I think being able to clarify what that means um, and that it isn't it that it is within the confines of a, of having supervisors, um, the system of supervisorial districts. Um, I think that's an important piece that we can absolutely specify um, in the context of the use of the word holistic, it was um, repeatedly used for uh, the purposes of demonstrating that this isn't just simply the actual process of drafting maps, um, but really includes 
everything that happens before the task force even begins its work. Um, and what if it doesn't complete its work? Um, and so it's kind of the pre, during, and after process of redistricting, but not questioning whether redistricting should happen at all. So I think that should be incorporated, and I appreciate that feedback. Great. Thank you very much. Um, the other question I have, and I don't know, this could wait, um, but I'm uh, assuming that the members of the commission are aware that the Sunshine Ordinance uh, Task Force held a special meeting on Monday with members of the redistricting task force. I'm not aware of any outcomes of that meeting or what happened. I um, was late to finding out about it. Um, and I would just be curious if anyone here participated or has any sense of what happened at that meeting on Monday. I believe it was on Monday. Hi. Uh, sure, I'm going to speak to that, I believe. Uh, just in time. <laughs> Thank you, Director Arns. Oh, yeah. So I didn't attend either, uh, Commissioner Bernhold, but uh, the task force was trying to determine who the uh, record keeper was, uh, especially for the emails related to or associated with the task force members. And my understanding was that the clerk of the board's office was designated as the record keeper. Uh, however, the Department of Elections is the, the department that's up the email account with the Department of Technology. And the concern is that when an email account is, is canceled, there's a 30 day clock that starts ticking. And once that once 30 days um, hits, then the account is essentially wiped clean. And so the department, since we re had received some uh, records requests prior to the, this, this, this task force meeting uh, this week or last week, whenever it was, uh, we had already <laughs> saved all the emails onto our server. So, that, and we also put a litigation hold on the account. So there's, there's no danger of the, uh, of the information being deleted or, or not available, and it doesn't matter if, if DT were somehow to to move forward uh, and, and miss the, the litigation hold and somehow you know uh, let the the account expire. So that's sort of a summary of the situation. Super, that's very helpful. I would also just then note that um, I suppose that's captured in this outline under number five C, intercommission communications and political communication. But since it's a lived experience problem, we would want to make sure any future uh, review process uh, addressed some of those issues like um, staffing and technology and responsibility and things like that. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I agree. I I'm finished. Thank you. Okay, I have a um, couple a few comments, but I just wanted to begin by thanking both of you for your good work on this. It's it's obvious that you've spent a lot of time, you know, thinking about this, and it, it seems very comprehensive in terms of um, what's what can be covered. Um, so I have two very minor things I just wanted to add to the list, and then kind of a larger comment that is similar to the comment that Commissioner Bernholtz made. Um, just there are two things I don't I don't think we're specifically called out, but one is um, like who should appoint the members, you know, as distinct from the composition. So maybe that section could be phrased something like composition and selection, maybe. Yeah. And then the second thing was like independent of the onboarding and and when the map making process should begin. Maybe have a something about the overall timeline, and in particular. How early can the members be appointed relative to like when the maps or the census data is finalized? You know, can they start potentially earlier just to give more time for the whole process? It's kind of, kind of more of a legal. May, may I ask for clarification on that? Um, so when you say the overall timeline and how quickly like the mapping process can begin once commit, uh, task force members have been selected are you referring to something different from to be the tactical planning of the timeline just are you suggesting that we provide strategic recommendations about how quickly 
members should or members should be selected. Can you just clarify what specific yeah. part of that? So I was I was saying timeline like separate from the timeline once the task force is appointed. So like even okay. earlier, like how because I think right now it's kick started when the census data is finalized, but like are there are we would you be legally allowed to start picking members even before that just to kind of mm -hmm. get things rolling? Yeah, I mean, and I believe also this year, because the census data came out so late, that process did start earlier, did it not? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, we actually. And the census data was released, yeah. Yeah, we, the Elections Commission, actually, uh, if I recall, appointed our appointees first and then actually tried to move the board <laughs> and mayor along. Be knowing that um, the data would come out and the task force would have to start map making, the idea was to try to appoint the body to do some of this pre work before that. It was not a successful effort, but I think uh, <laughs> Commissioner Jordanic's recommendation is right on point again from recent experience. So, just to not to harp on this, but so I understand correctly. After basically best practices on how quickly the the kickstart the whole thing. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Just to clarify what I was saying, the um, the when the mayor, the board of supervisors, and the elections commission can appoint as prior to census data. One additional thing I wanted to add into that is also exploring alternatives. If say one of the appointing bodies does not meet that best practice um is there a suggest do we want to also incorporate a suggestion of um alternatives where if there aren't specific deadlines that are met by those appointing bodies then the elections commission would step in to appoint the others um, because it sounded like the process had that had slowed the process down in some capacity so i guess just making sure that i understood your comment so I can incorporate the feedback and then adding that additional point. Yeah. Yeah. And then the last comment was re related to what Commissioner Bernhold says, and it's kind of related to the holistic word. But um, so, and also there's a sentence in there about how the purpose of redistricting is to ensure fair supervisorial representation. So one of the, one of the um, sort of like, I'm not sure if problems is the right word, but one of the issues that comes up in these types of conversations is people um, might not be aware that there are alternatives to single member districts that can provide better representation for voters, that it's sort of like an inherent limitation of only having one person represent a district. And it's not just the matter of whether there's districts, but even if you do have districts, you could elect um, multiple people from a district, you know, perhaps proportionally. And um, so, and I understand that there may be a desire to, to limit the scope of the conversation, but I think if we do limit the scope of the conversation, I think we should, um, it would be good to acknowledge the limitations of single member districts and then state, um, you know, maybe without making recommendations beyond it, but just that there are these other approaches, although they won't be considered within the scope of this document. So, um, just so that we don't promote a perception that this is kind of like the best that can be done with respect to representing the voters. Um, if, if we do decide to, to limit the scope in that way. I have a question for Commissioner Bernholtz, um, because I think Commissioner Jordanic is talking about a situation where there still would be districts, but then they may, may not be single member districts or there may be fewer districts. And would you feel like that would be, um, you know, would it be worth having part of a session to just educate the public and the commission on what some of these other Alternatives look like. Could I just add one? And but just so you know, Commissioner Bernholtz, and also not just 
but also how they're elected, like whether they're elected proportionally, you know, or, or versus. Yeah, I, I, I mean, mean black voting. speaking from my, you know, my perspective on this is for the Elections Commission to take on lessons learned and better practices as an educational process for both ourselves as as the commission and in our role vis-a-vis -vis the public um, to do that within the confines of the existing laws about supervisorial districts in the city and county is a massive undertaking it's huge what you've outlined here uh, it's critical it's important i don't know that there's anybody else to do it and therefore i can be convinced that we should do it um, but it's an enormous task to go anywhere beyond that. I actually think gets beyond the realm of the elections commission, um, into real public policy making about dem democratic processes. Um, and we are a body in charge of, uh, oversight of the department, not in charge of public policy about democratic practice. So, um, just to say nothing of the fact that I don't think we're resourced well enough to do so. So, uh, my own thinking about this is, um, the smallest piece of work that I could, the, the tightest boundaries I could draw around this piece of work still leaves an enormous amount of work. Uh, so I'm, uh, I think it's, um, not something we could do well. I don't necessarily think it's in our purview to take on those bigger questions. I agree with uh, Commissioner Jordanic that a well-crafted memo that says we're not taking those on because they're beyond our our resources and our scope is is sufficient. Because to not say it is um, to pretend that we have all agreed that this is the best. But it's also, um, I think it's important that you that boundaries be drawn on this or we'll never get anything else done. Um, Great, I appreciate that point. It's, uh, <laughs> well stated. Um, <laughs> Not sure we'll get this done, but I know yes. we'll never get anything else done. Well, you know, much better resourced organizations have like not succeeded <laughs> in yeah. debating this yeah. issue. So. Um, but I do think in the same way in the document that, uh, uh, that was shared, um, at the last meeting, I, I acknowledged it, you know, in a sentence <laughs> in the intro uh, for the same reason, because, because of exactly what you said, we don't want to pretend that the system we have is the best, but it is the system we have. And, and I do think it is squarely within our purview to at least fix the system we have. <laughs> so, um. I guess just a few points, I think, piggybacking off of Commissioner Bernholtz, and I wasn't here at the last meeting. I absolutely agree that something should be done as a reaction to and in response to the feedback we got from, you know, our meetings that involved the redistricting task force. I guess I have more questions at this point than answers. I, I are we the right body to do this? I don't necessarily think that we are. Uh, I agree. I don't know who else would be that body, but um, we are not experts. And I know one of the goals is to educate ourselves more. And I know, Commissioner Dye, you have a lot of anecdotal uh, experience and expertise. But I think I think that is concerning to me. I think a number of these items. I mean. You know, we reaffirmed our independence from the redistricting task force. I think a number of these items go a bit to decision making and values and those things. And so I, I get a little bit concerned whether we're kind of getting involved in the substance of it more so than just the process. Um, Again, I don't necessarily think we are. I, I guess I just have a question to see how this would all come how this would materialize. I think if I were looking at it just in a vacuum, we are involved with appointing the task force members. So I think certainly it's appropriate for us to give advice and guidance to future us on how that works. And I think that's kind of, to some extent, a few of your items in number one. Um, 
because that's something we we can control and we have direct experience in. I think the question of oversight came up quite a bit, and that's one that we talked a little bit about in our meetings, but we never really resolved. So I think that's something we should talk about and how that, you know, oversight generally and how that looks for our appointees specifically. All of the other stuff, I get a little bit more. I guess I'm just not certain that we're the right ones to tackle it. Um, we did get a lot of feedback directly from, you know, s subject matter specialists and members of the public during our meeting. So I think it's important that we memorialize that. I guess, again, the synthesis of all of this, this exercise that we're building out, which as Commissioner Bernholtz has kind of said is, is pretty massive. I just I'm I'm not sure it's for us, it's it's our job or appropriate for us to do it, but I can be convinced. Certainly, I don't know who else there is. Um, I think getting into super, you know, the fact that the conversation already went to whether supervisor. I'm not even going to say that word correctly. So I'm gonna <laughs> stop. Districts is appropriate is a, that's a politicized issue in the city, which is certainly not our goal to wade into. And is also just so massive and I don't think we can tackle all of democracy with a little D. So, uh, I guess more questions than any answers. Sure. I just, I'm, I guess a little bit skeptical of our ability or the appropriateness of this commission to tackle all of this. So I'll stop there. Thank sure. You. But also thank you for your work. I, I know I saw drafts go back and forth. I know how much uh, time and effort you put into this. Thank you. Um, thank you, President Chapel. I really appreciate that feedback and all, additionally the component of oversight, which was is just an ongoing ether of confusion. Um, and I I think it's fair to talk, I think your point about, you know, thinking about member composition and also the elements of, you know, our appointees what they might be accountable for. I think that all is fair. One thing that I that I don't think that um, had been included in some of that point that I do feel like we should address as a commission is the amount of community input surrounding the lack of um, of accountability, transparency, and fairness um, for um, for communities and specifically marginalized communities, um, that there was a concern about that being tainted in some capacity, but also what I've continued to say in many meetings and those meetings is that I, I am most concerned about communities coming to our meetings and saying, we're not being listened to, we're not being incorporated, our communities are being split up and we're not being provided clarity on why. And I do feel that as a, an appointing body, it's our responsibility to, it, to really take that feedback to heart and also open it up to those same communities to say, to ask what they would want to see different so that we can then kind of um, synthesize it and share it with the Board of Supervisors in a memorandum to make the process more fair. Um, and so if we do narrow the scope, which I'm open to, I just really wanna make sure that the community input and outreach and participation is something that is strengthened. So um, to address some of your concerns directly, <laughs> President Chapel. I, I, you know, if you look at the three appointing bodies, we're the only nonpartisan independent body. Uh, you know, I think part of what I would want to explore is whether the appointment process should go the way it currently goes. Um, you know, I think if you look at best practices, um, you know, the Board of Supervisors in particular has a direct vested interest in the outcome and should they be part of the process. So I think that it's not obvious that there's anybody else who would look at it. And I, the reason that I was inspired to take this on, even though I had thought I'd left this behind me, um, 
is that our mandate as the Elections Commission, we were created to ensure, you know, free, fair, and functional elections. And if, if, if the maps are not fair, everything else that Director Arntz does after that doesn't matter. So, so to me, it's like goes fundamentally to, to why the Elections Commission exists. Um, the other thing I would say is, I don't think we need to decide at this moment what the outcome is. I think that this could, we could decide, we purely want to provide a public forum and really educate ourselves and the public and, you know, uh, catalyze debate so that other people can go forth with a charter or amendment. Um, I do think if there are other charter amendments that are proffered, whether it be from the Board of Supervisors or you know, uh, groups out there that put something on the ballot, I would think that we would want to comment on it. But in the absence of anything else, we may decide to just like throw all this information out there and, and see what bubbles up and simply respond if, if something comes up. And I think we don't have to decide that now. Like I said, there may be external events that uh, DCAs have promised to keep us informed of if there's, uh, you know, other charter amendments that are, you know, percolating out there that will have some advance notice, and then we can decide whether we want to speed up our timeline or not. So, um, so I, I think that can be decided later, and maybe after we're a lot more, you know, all of us feel very smart on this topic. Um, and the other thing is I would be concerned precisely because of my point about the holistic nature of this, of like picking and choosing which one of these categories we look at, because I, I really don't think they can be looked at in isolation. Um, so I do think we take it on, we, we should explore all of these things, but like I said, we don't have to necessarily come up with a recommendation at the end. The other um, comment on oversight, I actually feel fairly strongly on this, and I actually feel like we did essentially decide this in that last meeting by affirming the independence of the redistricting task force. I don't believe the San Francisco Elections Commission has oversight over the redistricting task force that in our current charter, we are simply an appointing body and we have an interest over our three appointees, which is why we had that special meeting. Um, you know, that is something that we could discuss, right? The type, independent, you know, body, that is, you know, item number 1A. Uh, I don't imagine we would say it's a bad idea, but if you have an independent body, you need to have some guardrails so that, you know, you'd want to feel comfortable that any group of whatever the number is of commissioners, that you would be comfortable with the selection process, with the composition, with, whatever outreach was done to, to get those people on the commission and whatever uh, protections there are for the public for accountability, transparency, and removal of these commissioners that you would end up with a fair map at the end of it. So that's kind of what uh, my thinking was on, on uh, kind of looking at these different aspects. And I think that Commissioner Shapiro did a good job of bucketing all of the line items I had in my table in the last, uh, uh, for the last discussion document. So I'm wondering if there are other questions. I, I, I'm thinking that um, our first guest speaker will really help put this in historical context and might raise more questions. I just wanted to say one very small thing, which was in response to a small comment you made um, pertaining to if the representation, the, of the supervisor, <laughs> supervisor <Surreal>. districts <laughs> um, are not fair, then everything else doesn't matter. And I wanna be kind of careful with that type of thing because um, I believe any exercising in the democratic process is important and critical. And I know you didn't mean it that way, but I just think that was something I really felt strongly about supporting that there's so much to the democratic process and um, obviously, we want fair maps, um, but respectfully having just wanting to respect the process of our electorate and voters and our election administration. So well said. 
Are there any other questions before we ask our first of our speakers to help us understand? Um, with that, Mr. Stephen Hill, if you would grace us at the podium here. Um, his uh, bio has been posted, so I'm not going to go through the, his very impressive background, but say I will note that he has been a past advisor to this body. And we are very lucky to have someone with his expertise who happens to also be a San Francisco resident. So please regale us with uh, the history of redistricting in San Francisco. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Perfectly. Um, well, it's good to be back before this body. and Good to see Director Arntz again. Um, and congratulations on another election. Nothing, no uh, ballot boxes floating in the bay, nothing of this nature. So we all remember those days, or some of us do anyway. Um, so um, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to, to tell you a little bit about uh, I mean, my involvement has been in, in, in what I call multi-everything cities, trying to get representation in multi-everything cities for the past 25 years. And every city is different. Uh, you have to find the, 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 what works for your city, what works for your demographics. And so that led me to be involved in, um, in 1994 there was a, a ballot measure called uh, Proposition L that was passed creating an elections task force, very much similar to you, but its uh, purview was broader. Um, it was came out of a, an, an, a historical move to go back to district elections in San Francisco. And so the, uh, I think that the assumption on the part of many people when that election task force was passed by the voters was that it was going to be the step towards going towards district elections. And um, the people who were appointed there were appointed by a diverse body, just like you are. They were non-experts. There were no experts on this task force at all. It was pretty much like the tradition, some of you have heard about, perhaps about citizens' assemblies and how citizens' assemblies are assemblies of almost randomly selected jury pools. And you, you bring them together and you give them the expertise and then they, they bring their values, which are not supposed to be steeped in those of incumbents and partisanship to come up with the best solutions. So uh, this elections task force met, and lo and behold, they ran into pretty much the same thing you ran into in the redistricting this time around, except this was 25 years ago. And that was, it looked out, you know, when you start looking at where different communities live and how you're gonna draw districts for them, um, you discover that it's not so easy to do. Because I remember one conversation, people saying, Oh, well, that will be the North Beach um, Little Italy District. Cinema said, no, that would be the Chinatown District. And so you had different, immediately different demographics who were always already starting to make claims on this will be mine, this will be yours, and, and these sorts of things. So as a result of that, the Elections Task Force actually put on the ballot a second proposal, um, what's now called proportional ranked choice voting, because they wanted to give the voters a, cho a choice. It was up to the voters to decide. They didn't want the incumbents decided. They wanted to have the non, the nonpartisanship of the elections task force, and then the the uh, the, the values of the, of San Francisco voters to decide what is best for them. Um, in the process of drafting these two initiatives, this was Proposition G, Proposition H. Uh, the elections task force was pretty insistent that the district lines would need to be in the ballot measure because they realized that the district's lines are crucial. So uh, that process was turned over to um, Professor Rich DeLeon at the Public Rich Research Institute at San Francisco State University. And I was an advisor to Professor DeLeon as to the elections task force and to different members of the task force. And so, you know, they set about trying to draw these lines. And Professor DeLeon drew, drew a number of maps just like you went through recently. Um, they were put out to the community, feedback was, was given, and then the, uh, the, the maps were, uh, one of them was selected by the elections task force to go into the voter initiative proposition G. And my prime, I, I like to joke that one of my primary contributions was, I, ha I was one of two people that had to drive every line of the districts to make sure they weren't going into alleyways and such things. And we did find a few that were going um, in the wrong direction, so those had to be adjusted. Um, so Proposition G wins, 56% um, of the vote I think it was, and it goes into effect. It didn't go into effect until 2000. And um, the, uh, 
Now, part of the deliberations of the Elections Task Force was about criteria. And, you know, at the time, uh, you didn't have things like social media and really powerful computers that everybody could get their hands on, Every, a lot of community groups drawing their own district lines. So the, um, the criteria were, uh, on the advice of the city attorney, were left fairly vague. There was no order of prioritization. So you had criteria like communities of interest, compactness, contiguity, the usual ones you saw in redistricting at that time in the mid-90s. This was not anything radical, really, though it was a fewer cities did it than states and federal government. But it's, it's, it was allowed uh, to, to, to have criteria, but just not to really have strong orders of priorities with it. And it wasn't like it was necessarily legal, just the city attorneys being how they are, they tend to be um, conservative and they, you know, a number of things were put in there to make sure that it would all hold up illegally. So, um, you know, when Professor DeLeon drew the district lines, um, some of the same conversations you saw this last time around in districts 10 and districts one went on. So you had district 10, which is, you know, uh, Bayview Hunters Point, Potrero, and, um, you know, whether that would be a majority uh, minority black district, it wouldn't, the population wasn't high enough, um, linking it with the, uh, the uh, progressive to liberal um, uh, perspective in Portrayal Hill, so you'd have the chance for a black influence district, as it's called, so it would allow a black candidate to potentially win there um, it, by making uh, alliances with the progressive to liberal white population in Portrayal Hill. And in fact, the first um, supervisor from there, Sophie Maxwell from District 10, came from Portrayal Hill. So she was able to create those relationships that then for the last 20 years has given um, ongoing black representation in District 10, even as the black population has dwindled. And then in District 1, there was a big discussion around whether Seacliff should be part of um, uh, district 2 or District 1 and, you know, contiguity versus compactness versus communities of interest. And the decision was made, and, it, and generally I would say even though the criteria weren't ranked in any way, generally communities of interest was the criteria that was relied upon the most. And so it was decided that Seacliff was a more of a community interest with the marina rather than with uh, d uh, the rest of District 1. And, you know, so we saw that conversation again renewing uh, in this most recent round. So the district lines were set, voters voted on it, they went into place in 2000, first elections occurred in 2000, um, and um, so there wasn't any f initial redistricting because the districts were already there. Um, the, then in 2010, next opportunity for redistricting came around, there hadn't been much population shift. And, um, you know, by and large, the De Leon districts, as they were called, were considered still fairly valid um, for San Francisco in 2010. And there really wasn't much controversy around it. It all was quite smooth, even though there was a redistricting task force set up. Um, but it all was fairly non-controversial. I should also say also in uh, as part of the overview of San Francisco elections, in March 2002 is when we passed ranked choice voting. Uh, first election was in November of 2004. It was the first um, passage of any kind of ranked ballot system in the United States in many, many decades. And, um, and getting that all ready was a lot of work, as we know. Getting the voting equipment ready, getting the vendor ready, it was all new. So everybody was trying to figure it out. So um, we got that figured out, and then and, and you know things kept moving forward until then we get to uh, you know 2000. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention was the elections task uh, elections commission itself. That was established um, by Proposition uh, uh, E in, two, in November 2001. So in November 2001, there was a ballot measure put on for both the elections commission and to revamp. The, um, the Ethics Commission. And this was part of a broader, you know, that was when we were having ballot boxes in the Bay and these sorts of things, and there was a big push in San Francisco. That passed with 63% of the vote, very strong vote in favor of, of establishing this commission um, in which different appointing authorities from different branches of government would be able to uh, have input into what would happen here. Um, 
it, and it was also almost a unanimous vote of the Board of Supervisors to create the Elections Commission. So this was uh, something that everyone viewed as uh, something that its time had come to do this. Before that, um, the, uh, the, the, the the redistricting task force, as it was going to be reconstituted every 10 years, would have been appointed by the Director of Elections, which at the time was actually called the Registrar of Voters. Um, and so th this was part of Prop uh, G created, uh, said that if an elections commission is ever created, uh, uh, if, if uh, elections commission is ever created, then, then, then the redistricting would be handed over to that, re um, to the three appointees to the redistricting task force would be handed over to the elections commission rather than to the director of elections. So it was all part of, you know, Prop G in 1996 than setting up the Elections Commission itself in 2001. So, um, so then we flash forward to 2020, 2021, and suddenly a much different situation arises. Population shifts in San Francisco. Um, there is, uh, you know, much more controversy around redistricting as we just saw. And, it, but for me, it was very, very familiar because it was almost like the same conversations in 1996 over how to draw those original district lines in the communities of interest versus contiguity versus compactness. And, you know, I mean, this is really the challenge in any kind of uh, single seat district system is that, you know, my representation, uh, my my win is potentially your loss. And, and so the San Francisco sort of ex avoided this conversation for 20 years because the original lines were done in a fairly uncontroversial way by Professor Rich de Leon, overseen by the Elections Task Force, and then 2010 was non-controversial. So now, we, you know, in 2021, suddenly you're experiencing the controversy that pretty much every state, every city that has districts experiences. And, and, and um, you know, there are options that you can do about prioritizing the criteria, perhaps, there's lots of things you could start looking into, but it doesn't change the fundamentals that when you have 11 seats and you have 800 something thousand people in San Francisco and you have various uh, constituency groups and minority groups and everybody defining themselves a certain way in this multi everything city, you're going to uh, find yourself, um, you know, up against a, a real challenge often. So um, that. I guess the uh, the thing I would leave you with is, I have a rule of thumb. I like to call it. Uh, it's called I call it the golden rule of representation. Give unto others the representation you would have them give unto you. And uh, I think pretty much San Francisco violated that this past uh, redistricting. And so, th if you have a think of that as a golden rule that guides you as you think about how are you going to build into an inherently controversial process something in which people f try to respect each other and try to give representation to others that they would like to have, that might be um, uh, a good uh, you know, rule of thumb. And, 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 I'll, and just kind of, uh, my, for my own amusement, I'll pass on to you what Professor Rich DeLeon said in 1996. He said, don't be stuck to the flypaper of old ideas. There's lots of ways to give better representation today, um, including better ways to do redistricting. Um, you can do things like randomly drawn um, uh, 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 commissioners on the redistricting task force. Uh, there's, there's lots of ways to do this that, that no one knew about in 1996 for the most part. So be a little experimental, be a little bold, and uh, and push forward. You might find that uh, it, it becomes very energizing and exciting for the people in San Francisco who right now, I think, are feeling a little beat down by the process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Questions? Um, I have a question. So one of the questions that uh, <laughs> raised by uh, ah <laughs> raised by uh, President uh, uh, Chavel was, you know, who 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 should should do this? Look at how to improve the redistricting process. Should should it be the Elections Commission, or is there another body that might do it? 
Well, um, you know, in, in, in reading Proposition E, the, the wording for it, there's nothing in there that does suggest that you shouldn't. Um, but there's certainly nothing that says that it's your job. Um, and it's, um, I remember with the elections task force, they had to take on a lot of things and deal with a lot of things that they didn't really anticipate initially. Um, because it's just inherent in the process. You know, it's hard when you're writing this legislation. I've written legislation. You, you try to cover unintended consequences, but, you know, you, it, um, you can't always do that. So, you know, you could leave it up to the Board of Supervisors, but obviously there's inherent problems with that. You know, it, you want to remove the self-interest from it. Um, I, I mean, I, there's really no other body in San Francisco. Maybe there should be. Um, I, in fact, I, I'm writing an article right now about what's going on in Portland, Oregon. Um, they're making a very big, uh, a charter commission just has recommended some very big changes there. And they actually have, a, a in their charter, it calls for the um, a charter commission to be established every 10 years. So if San Francisco had something like that, you could have a charter commission right after the redistricting uh, task force does its work, possibly badly. <laughs> And, um, and so you'd have a, 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 a process already built in that would allow this kind of discussion to continue. Um, so, you know, I, I really, I'm hard pressed to think, I mean, the, off, the mayor's office has an office of, of neighborhoods. That could be a potential body, but, you know, I, I remember in the past trying to get the, officer, uh, the office of neighborhoods to do um, education around ranked choice voting, right? And you know we were advised not a good idea. You know you don't want the mayor's office doing that. It's not considered objective, fair, nonpartisan kind of thing. So um, if there's no other body set up, I guess it depends on one's personality. I say go for it, but you know you have to you have to really gauge that for yourselves. I mean it doesn't have to be a lot of work. Uh, I don't think it, but it is you know it is work, and so. And I remember the you know the election the elections commission uh, when Reverend Arnold Townsend was on it, um, he he wanted to do more things like um, education in the community and uh, you know he was uh, wanted especially to do it in the in the black community. Um, so there's been in the past of the elections commission and I mean I've been coming to these meetings since the first ones in 2002. In the past there have been you know uh, elections commissions that took on doing bigger tasks that needed to be done, but there wasn't any obvious body in, the, in San Francisco to do it. And, and so, you know, really it's what, whatever four out of seven votes decides, or four out of five in this case, so. <laughs> Burn. Well, the Ethics Commission only has five, so everything you do there needs, a lot of things need four votes out of five, so. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions before we go to our next speaker? Um, is Julia still here? Yes. And we have uh, Julia Marks, who is the uh, Voting Rights Program Manager at uh, Asian Law Caucus and has addressed this body before, and her bio is also posted, and she has a few comments to make. Great. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you for having me, but mostly thank you for putting time into this topic and hopefully for putting a fair amount more time into it over the next six months or so. Um, it's very important that the Elections Commission looks into this. As you know, it was a very difficult redistricting process and the public wants to know what can be done differently. But redistricting is incredibly complex. Um, thank you for putting together a list of potential topics. I think that itself is a testament to how, how hard this can be for folks to wrap their head around. And having a structured environment led by a non-political body um, where these conversations can happen, where experts can be brought in, where documentation can be collected and shared so people can understand all the factors that go into making a successful redistricting body. That's really important. And so I really hope that you guys do vote to take the time to continue to work on this and talk about it and give information and structure to the public for this conversation. It also is very much in the scope of your work. Um, you guys are tasked with overseeing elections here. And um, as Commissioner Dye mentioned, elections fully depend on the system 
um, underneath them, including the maps. And so it's important that you help lead this conversation. Um, I really appreciated Mr. Hill's context on San Francisco specifically, but I'm going to pivot us to a, a bigger picture and talk some about the history of local redistricting in the state of California. Um, something that's very exciting is that there's redistricting happening in different forms all over the state, different types of commissions um, with different authority, different structure, different timelines. Um, and there's a lot for you guys uh, to think about and learn from looking at that landscape. So I won't get into each of those pieces today. I think that's something you guys should plan for later. Um, but I wanted to kind of step back and show how those pieces fit together across the state um, and how they've evolved. So there's been a tremendous growth in the number of California cities and counties using redistricting commissions over the last decade. Um, it's really a laboratory here. There's a lot to see. Historically, local governments uh, did their own redistricting. So the legislative body decided the maps and chose who their voters were. Um, but now there are basically four types of redistricting bodies in California. So the, um, the legislative body, so that's where the city council is doing it or the board of supervisors the old rule, um, but we also see uh, advisory commissions where they're just recommending maps. We see hybrid commissions where they're um, selecting a couple maps and then the legislative body decides. And then we see independent commissions. Um, and again, there's variety within independent commissions. The phrase is usually used to mean that the independent commission is the one that chooses the map, but the actual independence from the political process can go beyond that. And that's where a bunch of the items in your list of potential topics come into play. So who's the appointing body? What are some of the guardrails around qualifications? What are conflict of interest rules? So there are kind of two types of independence when we're thinking about commissions, decision-making authority, and then the guardrails that try to protect the system from political influence as well. So SF uses an independent commission um, and is actually one of the first big cities in California to do that. It was San Francisco and San Diego back in the 90s. And there's been a lot of growth since then, and that's for a few reasons. So first, there's the policy side. Folks don't want their elected officials to be choosing the electoral boundaries in their city or county. So that's part of the push. Um, second, the state commission has been well respected and was seen as pretty successful. And so I think that got a lot of advocates and communities to think, oh, we can have something similar to this at the local level. So the CRC's first round was back in 2010. And so we've seen a lot of commissions since 2010 that actually uh, replicate a lot of the structures and components of the state commission. So uh, cities that have similar structures include um, Oakland, Sacramento, Berkeley, and LA County as well. So those look a fair amount like the state commission. Um, we've also seen an increase in the use of independent commissions in cities that have moved to district systems because of litigation or potential litigation under the California Voting Rights Act. So those acts are trying to improve representation for minority communities. And usually in the package that comes with a settlement, there will be a move toward independent commissions because it's so important for the commission structure to support um, communities of interest and diverse communities as, as boundaries are redrawn after the census. And then we've also seen growth in uh, redistricting commissions in California recently uh, because there have been some really important legal changes at the state level. So historically, only charter cities uh, were able to set up independent commissions. Uh, state law said that general law cities and counties had to do their own line drawing and have the final authority. So a general law city or county could have an advisory commission or have staff work on the mapping, but at the end of the day, the politicians were the ones choosing their own lines. Charter cities, due to California's home rule doctrine, right, are, were always able to set up an independent commission if they wanted to. So that's how San Francisco was able to do that. Um, but it didn't really take off until the last 15 years or so. Um, 
But in 2016, there was a bill that allowed counties and general law cities to also do independent commissions. It also allowed advisory commissions, though those are not seen as a best practice and often leave the public fairly disappointed. Um, so with that law in 2016, it suddenly became possible for any city or county uh, to do this. The 2016 legislation was also important because it set out minimum conflict of interest rules uh, for independent commissions, but it just applied to general law cities and counties. So that's just one of multiple examples where there's law out there that applies in some parts of California that has not been included in San Francisco's structure, but is something you could look at. You could look at that state statute, which applies elsewhere in the in other types of jurisdictions. Um, and some of those conflict of interest rules include prohibitions on the potential, the commissioner or their family members um, engaging in certain political activities leading up to their service, as well as prohibiting certain activities after their service. Um, that legislation 2016 also set out commission transparency requirements and public engagement requirements. Um, and it, prohibited the independent commissions from drawing districts for the purpose of favoring or discriminating against a political party incumbent or political candidate. So those were really good government reforms, but again, didn't necessarily apply statewide just to the general law cities and counties that opted to create, which not everyone did, um, independent commissions. So um, after 2016, there was a continued increase in the number of jurisdictions that were using independent commissions. Um, some of the ones in the Bay Area include Berkeley, Oakland, the city of Santa Clara, Menlo Park, and Martinez. Um, also the cities of Sacramento, San Diego, um, Santa Barbara, San Diego, and LA counties uh, use independent commissions as well. So there are a lot of comparators out there um, with different examples. And advocates continue to push for independent commissions, um, particularly after this most recent uh, redistricting cycle. Um, San Francisco is not alone in having some challenges in redistricting. Um, and so there are pushes in a few different counties where you know, the public really felt that political considerations uh, were playing a role and that their communities weren't being kept together. Um, and then, Oh, just a note that due to the interest and appeal of independent commissions, um, there was actually a bill that passed in 2019 that would have uh, required independent commissions in all counties, um, but that was in all counties with more than 400,000 residents, but that was vetoed. So there's a little bit of a push and pull um, in terms of how, how many jurisdictions are actually making this shift. Um, and then an additional very significant reform came in 2019, and that's when the Fair Maps Act was passed. Uh, so before that, California law uh, regulating redistricting was very spare. There was <laughs> very little there. Um, so there were um, open optional criteria. The only mandatory criteria were population equality and compliance with the Voting Rights Act. Um, and there were minimal criteria regarding public hearings. There only had to be one prior to the hearing at which a map was voted upon. Um, and so the Fair Maps Act applies to counties, general law cities, and charter cities, um, and brought clear ranked criteria to the line drawing process. Um, Perhaps I've mentioned this before, but the, the ranking can be really valuable because it uh, sets respecting communities of interest relatively high um, and puts that above things like having easily identifiable boundaries, such as the instinct perhaps to follow a highway, which doesn't always serve community well, um, and also puts it above geographic compactness. So that's now in the law that applies to redistricting all over the state. Um, However, charter cities, if they set their own criteria, um, even if it's very limited criteria, like in San Francisco, are exempted from that provision. So that's something you could also look at. Um, and then there are some other components of the Fair Maps Act 
that apply regardless of if it's a charter city um, that are meant to help ensure it's really a transparent process and one that truly includes the community um, by having robust outreach and having folks from underrepresented groups, from language minority groups, hear that the process is happening and understand how they can get involved and give comment. Um, so the Fair Maps Act kind of takes both a substantive and a procedural approach in trying to get fairer outcomes and outcomes that are more responsive to community preference and needs. Um, as I mentioned, the Fair Maps Act overall does apply to charter cities like San Francisco, but there's the criteria issue, and then there are a couple other components that um, that the charter city can um, set its own rules for, such as the procedure if a deadline is missed, which in fact did become relevant this time around. So there's a little nuance there, but I think the, the range criteria is the biggest thing. Um, so as you hopefully embark on further investigation of this, I think it's really helpful to just kind of ground yourselves in um, why we're using independent commissions, why San Francisco would want to use its independent commission. Um, so I like to think of it in four pieces, increased participation by the public, increased transparency, less a less political process, and then finally more representative districts. So as you're going through all the, all the pieces of things you might change or adjust in this process, how does it how does it serve those goals? Like, how does it fit with the, the true purpose of the commission, which is to have fair lines at the end of the day? Um, and I appreciate that thought and care went into creating the SF Redistricting Task Force a couple decades ago, but I think there are a lot of lessons um, and it's worth the time to, to do additional inquiry into other ways to handle this. Um, as I mentioned, one of those things could be uh, looking at the criteria, um, also, some of you mentioned earlier, some, there are some structural pieces around the appointment process that you may want to look at. Um, the idea of randomized drawings came up. That's a very popular approach in other jurisdictions and is modeled on the, state, the state's approach. Um, and then the conflict of interest rules I mentioned. But there's, there's more. That's just an initial list for you all. Um, and I, I do want to say there are some pieces that kind of span uh, structural and operational, and I hope you can look at those too. For example, the timeline mentioned, the timeline issue you mentioned, some of that is set out in the charter, and then some of that is in choices that are made by the commission once they're seated. And so it would be great if your inquiry could look at both pieces, some of the legal changes that could be made, um, as well as best practices that you might wanna consider putting into law or otherwise document for folks uh, seven to eight years from now who are endeavoring on a new version of this. So um, that's all I have for now, but I hope that you bring additional speakers in to talk about these topics and share information and look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Questions? I have just one question. Um, actually, I have a small clarifying question and then a larger question. Um, you said that the requirement um, was, or the legislation has, was vetoed, as in vetoed by the governor? Yes. Okay. And then um, for the Fair Maps Act, the ranked criteria, what um, charter cities have employed ranked criteria and what has been the impact? I cannot give you a comprehensive list, no problem. Um, but we should, we can uh, follow up. And then I will say, like Oakland, just across the bay, right. does use rank criteria that are either identical to or extremely similar to the Fair Maps Act That's criteria. Yeah. yeah, and we've been in touch with organizations who've been active in redistricting in different parts of the state, and folks generally feel like the criteria are helpful because it it gives some grounding when there are competing interests and it's hard for the public and the line drawers to figure out how to deal with that and you'll have competing interests anyway so if 
like within a criterion, right, between COIs, et cetera. So if you can reduce some of that um, by having a ranked Absolutely. criterion, it's helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. So that was it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I have a few um, questions. The first two are um, briefer ones. So um, you might not know this off the top of your head, but or maybe you mentioned it. How many, approximately how many jurisdictions are using an independent I don't know that. Yeah. Like um, roughly or I can answer that. It's about 15. Yeah. Is 15 it 15? In the state of California. And then yeah. How many of those are general law? I think or that I, I think very know. few. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the, and then um, for the 2016 law, are the general law jurisdictions allowed to um, impose things on top of the base requirements? Yeah. Okay. And then the last question is, um, do you know, like, are there, are there different, like, good government best practices, like, independent of the laws that have been passed that might speak to some of the things we've listed that you know of? Uh, you mean in the long, the chart from Commissioners Diane Shapiro or the list for well, today? Of the, of the list of topics that yeah. were discussed today. Yeah, there are best practices. There's a great report um, from 2017 that does include a survey of all the different commissions in California. It's authored by Nicholas Heidorn, who would also be a good speaker. Um, and it hasn't, I haven't seen an updated version since then, but it does have uh, an analysis of the kind of basic components as well as recommendations about uh, best practices and citations for different parts of the charters and code for various jurisdictions. So you can see how they approached it. Is that from an organization or just him as an individual? He was affiliated with Common Cause. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I, not so much a question, but I, I think the three kind of goals you outlined, which were great, are kind of increasing transparency making it a less political process and, you know, increasing representation uh, through the district. So I think that's good for us as kind of guideposts. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm just interested in, over the, this process, understanding kind of what, especially the making it a less political process and increasing representation, kind of how that would look as far as actual kind of concrete things we can do. I think transparency makes it's probably a little bit easier, but I'm just, I'm like, I'm looking forward to kind of hearing, yeah. you know, what this commission thinks and, and what your kind of recommendations are on those points. I know that's not the purpose of this meeting, but it stood out to me that those are good kind of guideposts for us to be thinking about. And she had a fourth one, which oh, was you did. You the fourth one I meant. increasing okay. participation. Ah, all right. Engagement, Perfect. right? Perfect. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Are there other questions the other commissioners had? I was wondering if I could actually ask one question from the previous speaker. If that's could I do that? Yeah. Um, yeah, Mr. Hill. I was wondering if you could describe how was the um, the charter amendment that constructed the current task force. Who drafted that? Was that an outside group or which which one? The charter amendment that created the um, the task force, the redistricting task force. Yeah. Um. It was Proposition E was put on the ballot by the Board of Supervisors. Yeah, and I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit. Were you involved in that drafting at all or? Um, a little bit, yeah. Do you know, um, like, looking back, do you recall some of the, like, conversations they were having back then that might be specific to San Francisco or, like, certain things that, you know, some of these different knobs they were trying to turn in terms of how to construct the task force that might help us? Today, in terms of um, uh, all right, I'm getting confused. You're, you're talking about the redistricting task force, not your commission. So, Proposition E was your commission. Redistricting task force was set up by Proposition G in 1996. So, the goal there was to have uh, uh, diverse appointing authorities: mayor, board of supervisors, and the registrar of voters. Each would have three. So that was that that was not fair, controversial um, to have that kind of structure. It was fairly common uh, in places that were doing. Uh, redistricting task forces like this to have different appointing authorities. Um, 
So that, that I don't remember that being a whole lot of discussion, uh, except that, uh, as I said, they did put in there when an elections commission is created, then the registrar of voters appointing authority would pass to the elections commission. Okay, and then anything else about the structure of the redistricting task force that you can remember that might have been. No, I mean, at the okay. time, you know, these things were not as common as they are now. Okay. So, um, I think that, you know, everyone knew that if we, San Francisco was going to go back to district elections, it had had district elections in the late seventies and it was gotten rid of as a result of the assassination of, uh, mayor Moscone and, uh, supervisor Harvey milk. And that led to a, a, a huge effort to get rid of districts because it was blamed on electing Dan White. Kind of crazy logic, but that's just what, what was going on at the time. And so um, the they knew when they were trying to bring it back in the 90s that, you know, it had to be some sort of pointing authority that uh, created a separation of powers. Uh, you couldn't have one entity doing it. But, you know, at the time, they didn't really know about things like randomly selected draws and, um, you know, uh, different ways of, of even trying to potentially elect uh, elections task force or redistricting task force members. I mean, there's, there's different ways of doing it today that I think, you know, you, you, you might think about and consult with groups like, uh, like, like hers that, is, that are doing these sorts of, of work. Um, Common Cause also is still very involved in this. Um, and so, you know, I think it's worth just doing a little bit of check to see is, is the current structure of three, because, you know, with the mayor doing three and the board of doing three, you basically have six who are inherently probably going to be somewhat political. So it really makes your three appointments, um, you know, extremely important. And, and from what I've heard, you had like very few applicants. Um, you know, the city of LA had like 700 applicants to its elect its redistricting task force. And here, I, th I think you have like, what just 35, how many 35, right? 35. So, you know, and, and, and were those, uh, were those coming from a diverse group? What kind of outreach did you use to get information out to different organizations to let them know that, you know, how important this is. And it just kind of crept up on people is my sense. Um, so they didn't really come to you with, with a lot of applicants. So that's kind of outreach is certainly important. But, you know, even there, is it, does it make sense to have the mayor having three and the board of supervisors having three when, um, you know, they're gonna be inherently political? It, and some people believe that you can't remove the politics from redistricting, so don't even try. And, I, you know, I don't personally particularly agree with that um, because we have so much more data now on things like citizens' assemblies and. And how you actually can. I mean, the country of Chile right now is going through a, um, a constitutional convention in which they drafted uh, hundreds of uh, different uh, delegates, and um, the, the major parties there have you know, only a handful of delegates. It, it, most of them are nonpartisan independent delegates, to over two thirds of them. And it's because they put effort into how they selected those delegates. And that, they were picking hundreds of them from all over the country. I mean, if you're only picking nine, it seems like it, you know you might be able to come up with a process that um, gets that even the the, the part the politics that you get from the mayor and the board of supervisors out of it, and really has people who are going to come to it with the best of intentions instead of with their um, you know their own private agendas, you know, on cell phones with who knows who texting and calling to get their orders. That's what you want to avoid. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, um, so I think, uh, uh, Julia, you also mentioned, Ms. March, that uh, you'd be coming out with another report. Is that right? Yes. So um, this year, Advancing Justice and Common Cause, ACLU, and the League of Women Voters of California are collaborating on a report looking at how local redistricting played out in California this past cycle. Um, it is more focused on the Fair Maps Act than focused on independent commissions, but there should be some information that is relevant to you all. So um, we're hoping that'll be out later this year. 
So I hope it seems less um, overwhelming. There, there's a lot of data out there, um, a lot of other jurisdictions that have kind of leapfrogged San Francisco because we were we were first, <laughs> and we're kind of doing things the old way. Um, so the, an example that I will give that um, uh, Mr. Hill mentioned is this idea of random selection, not having appointing authorities at all. That was something that Michigan adopted. They basically copied wholesale everything we did in California, except the selection process. Uh, because our selection process in California is very, very expensive and very, very long. Uh, I think it results in highly qualified commissioners, but it's very, very expensive and very, very long. It also favors more educated people. Um, and Michigan decided if it was good enough for Greece, it's good enough for, for us. And they did random selection. Uh, you still have to apply, but they, they literally sent out invitations to a certain percentage of um, anyone with a driver's license was invited to apply. Uh, and very minimal kind of other qualifications, some weighting of the pool, but otherwise random selection. And at least in one cycle, it seems to have worked really well. One thing I just want to make sure that is incorporated, regardless of the process is, and I know I've said this a few times, um, but is inviting the communities who came and spoke to us um, in our initial first, like in that special meeting that we turned into that very long meeting, um, and then the second special meeting, um, I think it's really important that we try and invite those specific communities to weigh in on a lot of that. Um, and also just not to nitpick, but also the element of driver's license can also be somewhat oppressive, um, especially in a, in a um, city where Home, homelessness is quite challenging in and of itself. Um, many folks don't have access to driver's license. So we, I think it's important to have, whether it's that and not that we would adopt that specific policy, but I think being able to hear from those communities on whatever we're discussing here um, is something that we actively seek out um, as a part of this initiative, rather than it just being our small commission and um, some wonderful subject matter experts. I think the public, inviting the public needs to be something we really invest in. So, uh, so what's before us is a, an initiative um, that, you know, should we take this on and go for it, as uh, Mr. Hill suggested? Um, you know, we, you know, can tackle this, uh, we can, along with the public, learn about what's going on in other jurisdictions and see, you know, what would be best for San Francisco. Um, as someone who has done a ton of public speaking on independent redistricting commissions all over the place, uh, I've seen many different variations and, it, you know, one size does not fit all. Um, you know, California's process worked really well for California and it was you know, too fancy for Michigan in some ways, right? And other places don't have the same diversity we have here. Um, there are things that are unique to San Francisco um, that, you know, that came up in this last redistricting cycle uh, that, that we could be very specific about. For example, the issue of splitting cultural districts. You know, are there certain defined communities of interest um, that, you know, would want to be called out, for example. So, uh, so I would be excited to embark on this. I, there are a ton of experts that we can hear from and learn from. So I don't think this is like a building from scratch at all. I think we've had decades of experience with this now um, and our own experience in San Francisco and it's a matter of making it better. Uh, yeah, thank you. I guess, as far as kind of next steps, my understanding is that we actually, we don't have any action to take in this meeting. We probably won't for a while because we'll just have it on the agenda and it'll be an item that we tackle with. But I, I, I mean, I don't think there is a, I don't think we have to 
resolve to approve a plan. I think I see that as a living document that will kind of evolve over time. And I, I don't think we need to have a resolution to continue with this work. I think it'll just be an agenda item we continue to work on unless I'm unless commissioners see that differently. If if we're all in agreement that we want to take this on, I'm sure Commissioner Shapiro and I can kind of uh, work on a plan for the next meeting and the next meeting and work on some speakers. Um, I would love to hear feedback if there are particular speakers you'd like to hear from so that we can recruit them and have them lined up for us. Um, can we also invite the um, our special guests to provide recommendations on speakers that you would recommend? I know, Ms. Marks, you had recommended someone, but if there are others that you recommend we include, um, obviously, I've now said probably 10 times that I want to include the communities that came. Um, so if I think, Ms. Mark, I, I don't know if you have connection with those communities, but being able to potentially chat with Commissioner Dye and myself about how to invite those groups to come and participate in the process, that would be great. Yeah, my own thought is that we would actually uh, have some special hearings that when we get to a point where we might have opinions <laughs> and want to make recommendations that that we would invite um, the public to a special session that where we just focus on this uh, and take input. Yeah, I agree. When we get to that point, we might consider convening a BOPEC meeting um, to if that is an especially long meeting, it, depending on how that's going to look and how many members of the public, I think might make sense to do that as kind of a special subcommission um, but or subcommittee, but we can think about how that looks when we get to that point. I think your point's well taken of kind of what if, what is the goal for the next meeting? And so, and, and I hope, you know, as we choose to continue moving forward with this meeting to meeting, hopefully there will be times when it's not all on, on you, Commissioner Dye and you, Commissioner Shapiro, and we can kind of take turns or there will be pieces that can be moved forward by other commissioners. But I guess as far as the next meeting, what do you see as kind of the goal? How do we, we've kind of gotten the historical background, thankfully from our, our speakers today, kind of what is the next piece of the puzzle to start building out the direction that we go in? Um, I think it might be useful to uh, hear about a selection of other local commissions perhaps in the Bay Area and what their structures look like, just to, to give us some ideas of what, what these other animals look like. Um, and I'm thinking Common Cause would be the best organization to, since they were behind a lot of this legislation, uh, to maybe showcase that for us and just, what did Oakland do? What did Berkeley do? You know, what what did their independent commissions look like, and how are they structured, and how are they like a compare and contrast with San Francisco? Just a, so uh, almost kind of like your chart using <clears throat> that a little. Yeah, I think that's that's a great kind of next step. And then maybe we can then, I'm just thinking out loud now. And then we could dig into the each of the chunks and kind of, yeah. you know, after we have a couple of examples to look at. Is yeah. dig into the specifics of each one of those. What do you think? I again would like to incorporate the communities to weigh in on what they find most important rather than us determining that based on just another city. I think it's important other cities. So perhaps we can also ask Ms. Marks and any of the relationships that she has with community leaders to just um, support us in that outreach so that they know that these conversations are even happening and can provide public comment because I don't think it should be on just the commission to decide what is worthy of discussion and not. It should be the, the public as well. I've if also informally, I, I posted a public comment to the redistricting task force and let them know that we are discussing this and um, invited them to participate because having gone through the cycle themselves, um, you know, in addition to their written report, which I don't know if any of you read, but um, the, the 
multiple written reports from various of the redistricting task force members, I think, are interesting. They they had some recommendations themselves already. Uh, and perhaps you could include those as agenda items for next time as well. That's a great idea. In the packet, at least. Yeah. The other thing that I think uh, I would do just kind of to get us going is there was a report in addition to the report that Ms. Marks mentioned. There was a report um, that was published by the uh, the CRC itself, uh, which is probably less useful than the one that the League of Women Voters uh, commissioned to kind of assess uh, the inaugural CRC. Um, so that might be, we can put some of these packet items together for um, background reading and we will try to get it up early. Uh, since some of them are a bit long, uh, just because there are assessment reports that that uh, were done. I don't know if Michigan has done a similar assessment report, but I can find out. So that might just kind of get us rolling. Yeah, no, I, I think I'm starting to kind of think about how other options look like and, and people's experiences with those is a good next step uh, and a logical next step. Uh, all right. Okay. Um, so I think what that means is uh, when we get to item 10 on the agenda, we'll be talking about this being the on the next agenda and kind of we, we have an understanding of where it's going. So unless there's any other comments um, from public the comment. commission, I think we're going to go to public comment. So we do have one caller on the line. Okay. Mr. Pilpel, you're unmuted. Uh, it's David Pilpel. I had to move to the phone. I had to reboot the computer because the mouse froze, so I can't actually get to my uh, notes right this second. Perhaps I can get back in in a second. Um, I do recall um, uh, what what can I recall? I'm sorry, I'm getting a little uh, loopier than usual. Hard to tell. Um, I did serve on the redistricting task force 10 years ago in the city as an appointee of this commission and had that uh, experience, which I've talked about a little bit before, and I'd be happy to present at greater length with uh, a little more, more coherent uh, thought uh, at a future meeting. Uh, I also uh, participated extensively with uh, this past um, redistricting task force, which I agree um, was sort of less than in terms of um, uh, usefulness uh, from my uh, perspective, despite all the good intentions and lots of effort uh, that went on uh, seen and unseen. Uh, I appreciate the two speakers uh, tonight and, I, um, and their uh, perspectives, um, which really did uh, help put this uh, in context, um, I also appreciate the work that uh, Commissioners Dye and um, Shapiro put into uh, their work here. I, too, share the concern that um, uh, President, can I just call her President Chap at this point, um, uh, shared about, uh, I, I don't know that it was discussed as, as scope creep, but that the scope be, you know, carefully structured. Um, so that you're not taking on everything and not assuming a greater role than this uh, commission has. Um, I do recall from my notes that uh, this would require a, a charter amendment to change um, the, the big structural pieces, and it might be useful if someone determined if there was uh, uh, some interest at the Board of Supervisors to carry uh, a charter amendment in the future to uh, effect. Uh, whatever uh, changes the commission might be uh, mulling over. If nobody's interested in the topic, then this might not be a good use of the commission's limited time. The, speaking of which, the commission has uh, a secretary with limited hours, and although um, this would require a fair amount of time by the commissioners, it would also require some amount of commission secretary's time. So just about all of those things and uh, ignoring the call wait. Um, I, I can uh, I, I can come back uh, in a moment if I can be more coherent. I'm sorry. Oh, let me see if I can get my notes to open up. Um, why don't I defer to see if there are other members of the public? 
to talk. Thanks for listening. Yes, we just ran out of time. How's that for timing? Thanks. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Popo. Okay, we do have one other caller on the line. You are unmuted, Ms. Uh, Say. Um, thank you. Um, hi, this is Jen Say with the Legal and Voters of San Francisco. I just want to call to thank you, um, to thank the Elections Commission, uh, Stephen Hill and Julia Marks for giving such a great presentation, for having such a really thoughtful discussion about this process. Um, I think, as mentioned before by Lauren from a previous meeting, that, you know, we'll continue to monitor, um, monitor process in the meeting and, um, and, you know, just apologize that we weren't able to give input at um, this meeting due to our uh, busy schedules. Then to thank you to uh, Commissioner Dye for reaching out to us. Um, uh, one thing I want to bring up is that uh, I think something I was brought up earlier, I think um, Commissioner Bernholz asked about the Sunshine Ordinance Task Force and um, them discussing the redistricting task force. Mm -hmm. um, at the previous meeting, it was actually canceled so they, because um, the agenda had a wrong WebEx link. So they chose to actually cancel the meeting um, that right then and there and uh, they decided so, so they haven't actually discussed anything around this um, at the previous meeting and we'll discuss it at the next meeting. Um, other than that, um, I really do um, like the suggestion about reaching out to Common Cause California. I think for the, uh, for the legal and voters of San Francisco, um, we definitely reach out to them a lot around, you know, uh, asking them different examples of other jurisdictions. I definitely ask them a lot about how LA and San Diego, um, both the city and the commission and the, uh, sorry, the county uh, redistricting commissions and how they operated. And I think those are really good guideposts for how uh, we gave public comments for um, what, how the San Francisco redistricting task force should move forward. Um, anyways, um, thank you again and have a good night. Thank you. Uh, Martha, are there any other callers? Uh, no, we don't have any other callers on the line. Uh, I see there's one hand up that was Mr. Chilfell and he was already able to comment. All right. Um, okay. So we are closing out item number seven. We're moving on to item number eight, the director's report. Discussion and possible action regarding the director's report. Uh, Director Arts, thank you for your patience. I'll get over to you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so, uh, I, just to add to the report, I'm not going to comment on anything in the report. But uh, so we're almost done with this election. I'll probably I'll certify next week. The next steps are we'll do what's called the one percent manual tally. It's where we actually do a hand count of of, of the number of ballots equals one percent of the of the polling place and and put by mail ballots. It'll happen tomorrow at our warehouse on Pier 31. We're also beginning. We will begin the process of redacting. Personal information from the ballot images, because we post the ballot images on our website, so people can actually see what how votes were cast in San Francisco. So we have to redact the personally identifying information, and then uh, we'll try to get that posted when I when I certify next week. And uh, that's about it, really. So I can take any questions on my report or anything else. I guess. Uh, I'll open it up. Any questions from the commissioners? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, so, thank you for your report. Um, on the curing, I, what percentage of voters do you, are you able to usually reach for the curing for the vote by mail? It, I have not actually. I've not, I've not done any review of the percentage, but I, I can say it depends on the election. Like the, the November twenty twenty election had a higher cure cure rate than did this past election. Um, but I'll have to go back and look. I've I've never actually tried to discern a okay. percentage. I mean, curious. Like, is it you know, like, just in terms of able to contact them? Is it like ten percent or fifty percent? Or so you can you can get back to us at the next meeting. Well, we contact everybody, so it's a matter if we can Everyone will receive a hard copy notice in the mail. We we actually we, we mail hard copy notice. And I'm, most of them, I'm I'm assuming, will receive it. Then it's, it's a matter if we have valid phone and email ad, uh, phone number and email addresses, because we'll send a hard copy. Then if we have a phone number, we'll call. And okay. If we have an email address, we also send an email. But everyone is notified. Okay. There's okay. Then I guess yeah, the percentage that that are able to cure. And then on the, the my last question is, um, 
there's like the budget proceedings are starting now. And I guess you could tell us what happened at the meeting you're at, but I noticed there was, it says that there are three positions that are vacant. And then it also said something about PCS, PEX, and TEX. I was wondering if you could, um, like, number one, say what the three positions are, and then number two, what are those abbreviations? So the three vacant positions, there's a deputy director position that, that's vacant, and that's been used for what's called attrition savings for the past three years. We had been in the process of uh, filling it because we had to get go through a process with the mayor's office and DHR. Then the pandemic hit, and that all just stalled. So we have to come back to that. The second position is a uh, 1842. It's a management assistant position. And that's that would be someone that would be working in the admin on, on procurement and, and uh, budgeting and, and contracting, and also someone that would would be involved in these kind of special projects like voting system implementation. Or if we were to move to the Voting Voters Choice Act, for instance, that position would be involved in that sort of work. Another one is a uh, it's a programmer's position, and I I want to say 1062, uh, but it's it, it was a programmer's position that became vacant just prior to the April uh, election, special election, and the PCS is permanent civil service, uh, TEX is temporary exempt, and PEX is permanent exempt. Okay. Okay, and then yeah, and then the budget hearing. Was there any report back on that? No, today was the, the easy one because they were just was like a, the general presentation, overview of the budget, and any questions that the that the supervisors had on 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 the on the budget itself and the positions were was something that a lot of uh, departments had questions on. I received no questions at all on on the budget. I did receive a question uh, from uh, Supervisor Chan about uh, if there's been any change in in process now that vote, all voters are receiving a ballot in the mail. And then President Walton also asked me uh, if there would be any, if the current budget or the proposed budget would cover the costs associated with the pilot program that would happen next year. So the two, the two questions that I had. I see. And then what was your answer to that second question? So, so yeah, right. Based on the scope of the pilot program that's been, that's gone through the, the board and it's been approved. Uh, the vendors already indicated that it'll provide the, the resources and personnel uh, without charge, as there's no cost to the city for on that side. Then on the department side, just due to the scope of the of the current version of the pilot program, if it were to change, then my answer might change. Uh, then we would just fold whatever costs that were associated with the pilot program into our, our current budget. So okay, great, thank you very much. Um, I have a question about the election plan as well and just kind of the process of counting um, mostly because I personally was confused as a voter and assume there are other voters who may have also been confused and also just the national media that was focused on this election um, and so I wanted to understand how the department is educating the public and the media about vote by mail differences and the counting of ballots. So, for example, you know, the press release on the, I think the 10th or 8th um, said there were still 100,000 ballots that had um, that are likely to be counted and therefore I think only 127, 20 some odd um, ballots had thus been counted from election day. But when you looked at the top of the website, it said 100% of precincts counted. And so I'm curious with and, and I know in um, Vice President uh, Jardonic's questions pertaining to numbers of how people are voting now, I think is going to be really helpful. But knowing that everyone's getting a ballot in the mail and many people are dropping off their ballots, there may be implications around election results that the public should understand differently than in the past. And so I wanted to understand how your department is talking about this and repositioning itself based on the different forms of voting. So the, uh, the only change that really has happened is that we get more ballots on election day. And it also since uh, voters are, all the voters are receiving ballots in the mail. We, we stop processing the day before election day and we send out lists to the poll to the polling places indicating who's voted already. Now that, that allows anyone who shows up to a polling place without their ballot that they can receive a regular ballot and put in the tag later. Um, but what that does, th that stalls our process for a day. So we don't issue a report on Wednesday, the day after election day. 
But other than that, nothing else has changed as far as our process is concerned. And so when we issue press releases, I indicate that there will be no, re no results report on the Wednesday. Uh, I think also on our website, there's a, the, the, we have a schedule of releasing results. So we indicate that there will be no results report on, on Wednesday. Uh, but no, we're not. So other than that, that one change, there's nothing's different as far as the media and the public is concerned. So just so I understand, so the ballots that are counted that first round would incorporate the ballots that are simply that are simply cast on election day, not necessarily incorporating all of the vote by mail ballots that have either been sent in and or dropped off on election day. Correct. So the 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 first report every every election is the vote by mail ballots prior to election day. We make that clear in, in all of our materials. So that that hasn't changed. That's that's been consistent for a long time. But just as you said, so then the the, the uh, election day results that those are the the polling place vote. Those, those are the, the the votes from the polling places, and that hasn't changed either, as far as reporting is concerned. So there's been no change. The numbers are less. They have been less as far as in person voting is concerned. The last several elections since November 2020. But the process hasn't changed itself. Sorry. So you said the first round of ballots that are counted are the vote by mails that are sent in prior to the election. Right. Interesting. Um, because I actually had spoken with a just a member of the public who asked me why their ballot hadn't yet been counted when they voted ahead of election day. So I was, and I actually didn't know the answer. Um, and so. I mean, I don't know what their specific experience is. So it's the first, the first chunk is the vote by mail prior to the election. The second is just those who come in to cast a ballot on election day, not necessarily their mail-in ballot drop-offs. So the third is those that come in by mail after election day, in addition to those who used vote by mail, mail ballots that were dropped off on election day. Is that correct? Right, but the first report in, in, is, is issued election night. Right. And the second report is Thursday. issued on election night, and the second and third reports include the polling place votes, and then the, the subsequent the subsequent reports the reports that we have immediately after election day include the vote by mail ballots that we received. But then after we get through the, the vote by mail ballots, usually around the weekend after election day, we start to bring the, the provisional ballots into the count. And provisional right. ballots are people who went to a polling place. Yeah. So so the polling place ballots come back into the count. So they're, they're not. The polling yeah. place votes is not done on election day. Yes, because of the provisional ballots, but provisional ballots are only a small percentage. They are now because of the, the vote by mail. How, and also they're not because of how we changed the process. If we had not changed our process to send the list, if we voted already, we would still be receiving 20,000 provisionals potentially at a high turnout election. But now we receive just a few thousand. So, for example, if we're looking at the end of day on Wednesday, um, and you're thinking about these kind of three or three and a half, four chunks of phases that are really incorporated now in the process. What percentage of ballots are being counted through that Wednesday of the election day? So, meaning when Depends you on the election, there, there is no, there is no set number and it depends on what we received and the number of cards. Yeah. Because if we get a five card ballot, we, we, we count less going into election day than we do with a one, two, three card ballot. So there's no set percentage. I think it would be helpful, and I know um, Vice President Jordanic included some of this in the number, in the percentages that will be helpful for elections moving forward, to understand when people are voting like on the aggregate so that we can better explain because if you look at the way that the media especially in the in California in San Francisco and in the in the national news looked at what happened in San Francisco it was a in my perspective a misunderstanding of actually what was happening in terms of the counting because there was a uh, there were large generalizations made that were not actually but before many ballots had even been counted. And so I just want to make sure that we get a sense of that number so that we can better educate the public on what that process looks like from a phased approach now that so many people are using vote by mail ballots. 
Yeah, and we do. And I speak to the media throughout the entire election cycle. A lot of this, the media that's that's incorrectly reporting the percentage turnout, the percentage spread for Prop H specifically. I had already spoken that day, but they prefer to focus on not everything that I said. And that's very common. Yeah. So, I mean, certainly we can do more. I'm not against that. But at the same time, the media doesn't always grab everything that you give them. Yeah, absolutely. And not just Prop H, Prop C. I mean, all the propositions that were on the ballot. I think they're, but Prop H for sure was the one that cost, caught the most attention, of course. Um, and that's great to hear. I think it would just be helpful once we have those numbers um, that we will discuss to then maybe explore how to make it maybe, you know, as me, as a common voter looking at the website, I found it confusing when it said 100% of precincts reported that it didn't necessarily tell the full story unless you went to the press releases to see that still 100,000 ballots were outstanding. Um, and if you think about that, that's like 45% of ballots ultimately, because you had only counted at that point, I think 129,000 um, ballots. So that's a pretty different story. Um, so it's not necessarily in a, um, a push. It's more just something I want us to continue to talk about. So Thank speak, you. speaking of the reporting, um, so I think uh, Commissioner Shapiro uh, makes a good point. Like, uh, for example, I, I check my, um, track my ballot. I, uh, having changed my behavior, I now vote, use a vote by mail ballot and I drop it off. I dropped it off the day before the election. And it looks like it was actually counted on the 9th. So two day kind of turnaround. Um, so if, is that typical? Yeah, so it, it just depends on, on the volume of when we're receiving the ballots and, and when we would process the ballots. So, uh, so but, three would be typical then? Say again? Say? Two to three? I mean, just given our typical ballot sizes and everything. This was a three card ballot. Sometimes it's five. What, well, what do you think is typical for, well, it, like, the, if someone drops it off, does it take N plus two, N plus three? Yeah, usually within two days, someone's going to we'll get a, a note. But again, it's part of its volume and, and timing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, three days would be a, probably a long time for us not to uh, process the ballot. It depends, you know, where it was dropped off. If you, did you drop it in a drop box or? I dropped it yeah. in a drop box, one of the official drop boxes. Yeah, it depends. Like, so if we picked it, it depends on when, you, when it gets dropped off, when, when we picked it up. Where we are in the schedule of processing, if we're if we're pausing for election day, when that, you know, so we haven't had a chance to process your ballot yet. So just, yeah, just uh, very, there's a lot of variable, a lot of factors, but three days would be a long time for us not to provide any sort of information. So just saying, you know, as a voter information thing, just saying it may, you know, when once you drop it off in the Dropbox, we pick it up, but it may take us up to three days to process it, mm -hmm. but it will be counted. Yeah, but I was checking, right? I was checking, like, okay, I saw that it was picked up. Now, you know, I, I just like am very interested, and of course, um, it's a lot more relevant now that I'm on this commission. But I think that kind of messaging, just to let people know, if you drop your, you know, ballot off in a Dropbox, it may take two to three days to count. Mm -hmm. but That's a good count. point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Just so people have an idea of what to expect, mm -hmm. uh, because I think you know there was a lot of media reporting, and that may be what Commissioner Shapiro was uh, referring to, saying this is oh, this is a really low turnout exactly. election. It exactly. was like twenty eight percent or whatever, exactly. but it was inaccurate because just a lot of it hadn't been processed yet. Exactly. It's actually it was a pretty high turnout for a, you know, exactly between election, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, when it, when those articles came out. Only, yeah, that, only that was fifty percent, or a little bit more than fifty percent of ballots had even. Yeah, been. they were reporting really low turnout. It was like twenty eight percent or something like that. And I thought, wow, that really is low. And then, it wasn't low at the end. By the time all the ballots mm -hmm. got got counted, um, another question on the on the uh, results page on the website. There are districts where there are obviously East Bay, you know. Uh, contest is that just because of old numbering is like legacy or why is it showing no up? because when the, the there's census blocks on angel island and also on alameda island that are assigned to san francisco and we had a precinct in on alameda island in the last 10 years but the, from the from the previous of uh, redistricting statewide redistricting 
So, but all the uh, draft maps and shape files that we received did not have that precinct in Alameda Island. But then when, when the final maps and shape files were issued and the state drew the information into the statewide database and the state wanted to verify, and we, we, had, we had not received the final because the state distributes the final uh, lines and shape files. So we were using the, the draft information and we didn't know, we thought that the statewide redistricting commission had, had remedied us having a, pulling a, a precinct on Alameda Island which is on an uh, uninhabited little chunk of Alameda Island. But not only did we did we retain that little chunk of Alameda Island, we gained a census block in Angel Island. But everything that we'd received didn't, it, the lines were actually around that, that chunk in Angel Island, also on, on Alameda Island. And the shape files also indicated the same. So we don't know, we don't know, we don't know what happened. But now we have an extra, empty precinct that's will never have a voter in it and we have but because the state has to report all the districts and all the precincts in the districts and the system is hardwired to to report all that information even though we have no registered voters in those precincts in those districts and we never will and we'll never have any votes cast in those precincts we still have to include them in our reports and that's why you're seeing that okay that's that's interesting so just so I know that we drew, when we drew the first CRC drew the districts, we try, we were required to abide by city boundaries, which are weird, right? And are include uninhabited islands, for example. But I saw um, districts reporting with the 000 for East Bay contests, for example. And that's what I didn't understand because I, I wouldn't think that any of the San Francisco districts would have included any of the of the East Bay. Right, that's where that chunk of Alameda Island comes from, right? Okay. It's one block, one census block. In Alameda Island. But Angel Island is part of San Francisco, right? Uh, I think it's Marin. Everything everything else, because that, because the, the, the census block is assigned to, a, to districts that have, vote, have uh, votes reported in Marin, Marin Got County. It. So it's just that it's just literally like a few a few hundred yards probably of Angel Island, and I, and I don't we don't understand it, but it, and we thought it had been remedied, so we did not expect this. We and if we expected anything, it, was, it would just be an extra block on Alameda Island, it, like the previous issue would continue. But then we added Angel Island, and so that was our surprise. Um, so yeah, that's that's why. Okay. Um... I did have a, another question, which uh, is escaping me at the moment. See if anyone else has a question. Yeah, I just want to ask a follow up on the the issue of like the percentage of ballots that are counted on election night, because this is something that's come up frequently. Like, I think it happened in the mayor's race, the special election. It was very widely reported that the turnout was so low. And then like a couple weeks later, it was like one of the highest turnouts, you know, historically. And then I'm wondering, but on the results page, it shows, you know, X percentage of precincts reported and it kind of makes it look like you have 100% of the voters. So I'm wondering, is there, um, is there any way that you could have like a percentage of estimated percentage of ballots that have been counted? Like if you can um, sort of like estimate based on how many vote by mail ballots have come in, or at least flag to people that, hey, you know, on the results page that even though it says 100% of precincts, it could only be 55% of the ballots, you know, so people don't have that perception. Yeah, and the summary page, is that something that we can change because that's, that's something that we can format, but, a lot, but, the, but the other reports are hardwired from, from the system. We can't change those. Uh, and the precincts, again, that's just polling places. It's not, it's not anything, it's not vote by mail ballots, it's just the votes from the polling places. And we, we, we really can on election night, we don't know how many ballots are coming back to us until the next day. So on election night, we can't indicate the percentage of votes still to be counted because we, we don't know ourselves. Can you at least include a disclaimer that says, once we know X percent, you know, if it says 100% of precincts counted, what does that actually mean? That means like, those who voted on election day at poll sites, whereas let's say 70% of folks of voters actually vote by mail. 
at least then people will understand that if it says 100% of precincts counted, that's just potentially 30% of total ballots. Yeah, we can certainly put more messaging on our site. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I mean, 90% yeah. people vote by mail. Maybe we don't know. We don't have yeah, no, we do know, right? It's like 90%, right? It depends on the election. But this election, wasn't it like 90%? I don't know the breakdown. It might have been higher than 90%. For yeah, this I think it was 90 plus percent. So, so I think um, just changing when you say precincts reported simply says, just say in person voting on election day, you know? In person voting on election day, and then it'll become really obvious the vote by mail, you know, vote, and you can say vote by mail typically is 80 plus percent of the vote. Or yeah, I would be, I would hesitate to put percentage like that out there, but we can, we can certainly provide more explanation of the, the process. Yeah, we can look at that. I think that would be helpful because I think that is no different than what happened in the presidential election where, you know, it's like. It seemed like the vote flipped. It's like, well, no, we're just counting the stuff that's coming in by mail right now. So, it, you know, you would think we would know this better because, uh, you know, we we have a high percentage of vote by mail. I mean, it was two thirds before, and now it's according to this last election over ninety percent. That's a pretty significant change, even for San Francisco. So, so that way, people know to kind of discount the the first report and kind of adjust their expectations accordingly, right? So I, I think it purely is messaging. It's just, you know, putting it in context for people. Mm -hmm. I think that would be really helpful. Uh, okay, uh, unless there's any other questions from the commission, I think public comment. We have one caller on the line. Whoops. Caller, I'm unmuting you, and you have three minutes to comment. Oh, there you go. Sorry, you have three minutes to comment. Sorry, David Pilpel on multiple platforms. Um, let's see, three topics. Uh, without getting voted off the island, interesting discussion about uh, redistricting's effects. That might be a thing to add to the. Uh, chart uh, and those future discussions is having, you know, at least a day towards the end for the department to do a technical check to be sure that the lines intended can be precincted and that there aren't, you know, sort of those technical weirdnesses uh, about creating zero uh, voter uh, precinct. Anyway, I'll, I'll let you uh, sort that out for the chart. Um, I just wanted to talk uh, briefly about the June and November elections, I think, in addition to your discussion just now about reporting and clarification around that, um, the sort of <laughs> highly unreported thing is that of the currently 228,915 ballots cast times three cards is nearly three quarters of a million cards, all of which were run and counted in less than a week. and. Uh, I believe accurately, and I think that's pretty amazing that the director and his staff working two shifts over the weekend, preparing, organizing, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens here. And yes, we can boil it down to the numbers, but the fact is, you know, this department operates with great uh, efficiency, transparency, accountability, all the things that you want, and rather than putting out you know, a number that's fast, we put out a number that's right, and we want to get it right. Um, and so letting everyone vote who's eligible to vote and counting, counting accurately all the votes that were legally cast is sort of the hallmark of fair, free, and what's the third? Functional um, elections. And, and that's what we do day in, day out. So that's pretty great. And then as to November, um, I uh, just did a, a quick look on uh, candidates. It looks like um, one contest for supervisor, uh, there was only one candidate. Uh, two of them look fairly, that's district two, looks like district four and six are gonna be you know, contested and eight and 10 have uh, a contest, but might not be as contentious. So there's that and we'll see how the rest of it plays out uh, for November. But 
you know, once again, I think the department is doing a, a great job and um, I continue to be supported. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mr. Pilpel, coming in with seven seconds left. Uh, always calibrated correctly. Um, all right, moving on to item number nine, commissioner's reports, discussion and possible action on commissioner's reports on topics not covered by another item on this agenda. Uh, any commissioner's reports? Commissioner Giordani? Yes, yeah, so I have three quick things to report. Um, the first is I attached to the agenda packet a document that the um, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency sent out earlier this month about the um, the security vulnerabilities that a researcher found in, in a, a version of the ImageCast X. And this is something that Director Arns covered in his report but um, but that's also included here under the reports. Um, secondly, I included a document that of some numbers that I thought could be useful for the commission to have access to for future elections. And Director Ernst, I don't know of the ones that I listed, how many of them are um, would be easily obtainable for the current election, but um, if any of those are, Maybe it would be great to see those at the next meeting. Otherwise, um, maybe for the November meeting, we could have some of those. And these would just be, it doesn't have to be by precinct or anything, just globally. You know, how many ballots are sent by Dropbox and, and so on. Um, and then lastly, for this election, I um, did something a little bit different. I voted using the ballot marking device using the audio functionality. And um, I really just got a good sense of how that works with the Dominion's ballot marking device. <clears throat> I also did it at the last election too. And I'll have some comments on, on that experience at the next meeting when we discuss the election. So that's all. I just wanted to add a number that I wanted to add onto your, um, your list whichever the attachment, whatever it's called, which is just about what we were talking before around the percent before and on election day of vote by mail and um, in person. If we can have that level of granularity, that would be awesome. Um, I just wanted to tack that on to um, Vice President Jordanik's list. Sorry, it's getting late. I'm a little tired. <laughs> I do have a couple of things I wanted to add if no one has something to tack on to his comments as well. For this agenda item. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I know we didn't have the chance to talk about the racial equity reporting. Um, that is something that I would like us to discuss uh, moving forward. And I'd also like to discuss as a commission our, our own racial equity um, and inclusion. Um, is this just sorry, is this a commissioner report or is this something where uh, another agenda item? Because I, I think I apologies, yep. it is sorry, okay. future agenda. No, no problem. Again, it's late. It's no, <laughs> believe me. Um, okay, uh, did we take public comment on commissioner reports? No, on commissioner reports? No. Uh, I don't think so. I see. Uh, I do see a hand up. Okay. Okay. Over. You have three minutes to comment. Great, David Pilpel, and I do this without a timer. <laughs> um, so just, just very briefly on uh, Commissioner Jordanik's uh, one pager on election numbers. I think as you talked through that earlier, some of that um, information could be incorporated in the uh, daily um, uh, director's uh, press releases if it's as to sort of ongoing status, if it's sort of the look back of how many, you know, in total, how many used emergency voting, you know, was it three or was it, you know, 400,000, eh, probably closer to three. Um, but maybe some of those that, that lend themselves to uh, an after, a total after election report um, could either be incorporated in a, a, a subsequent director's report or you could have some discussion another time um, about 
how you evaluate the effectiveness of the election plan and whether you're getting um, the right information, not enough information, different information, ways to uh, analyze it. You know, some people are interested in the IRIS reports. They don't do a whole lot for me. But um, anyway, it, that may be a, a topic for a future discussion is what uh, numbers and narrative are most helpful for the commission to evaluate whether the election plan after the fact um, led to a, you know, 3F election um, or not. Anyway, that's just my thought at this point. I too am getting punchy, so I will leave it that. Great. Thank you, Mr. Popo. Okay. Um, moving on to, are there anyone? No other calls okay. on the line. Great. Uh, agenda item number 10 discussion and possible action regarding items for future agendas. I'm going to start because I have items that have been brought up. Uh, so we're going to add April 6 minutes that will be on their approval of those. Um, and we will get those posted with enough time for people to review um, the annual report for 2021. Uh, that was taken off of this agenda because we needed more time with it. So that's going to go back on for the next meeting. Um, talking about vacancies for this commission and potentially sending letters and what the content of those letters will be will be an agenda item for a future meeting for the next meeting. Um, and then a, an item. So typically, traditionally, the commission has taken a hiatus in the summer, kind of skipping either July or August meeting. So I'm going to start by asking director Arns whether there's any sensitivities on your end, as far as timing, whether there's a, a skipped meeting in July or August. Well, one thing would be the election plan. So normally it's 70, 60 days right now. Mm -hmm. So that would be in September. So now we would. Okay. Cool. And then I'll just to the commission thoughts on taking a uh, skipping a month uh, in the summer, July or August. I know we have a lot to accomplish, but. Thoughts on that is the question if we take both or either either typically. Yeah. Sorry, I was just clarifying. No, no. Um, so I guess the question is, you know, we've kind of had relatively long meetings for the last. I mean, basically, since Commissioner Shapiro and I joined, <laughs> probably nothing to do with us. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, by skipping a meeting, that means we might have to be willing to do longer meetings to to cover the items unless you feel like we don't have stuff to talk about if we're going to be putting redistricting on the docket for the next few meetings that's I mean, going to be substantive so no that's that will be substantive I, I think skipping one meeting in my mind doesn't mean we would double up on the length in a meeting but um dca floor is my suggestion um and humbly if you'd like to continue um, the work on um, redistricting, um, that could also be taken up by a BOPEC meeting. Right. Agreed. Um, and you can select or appoint new BOPEC members since I think <laughs> most of them are gone now. So we'll add that. Um, I don't, I, it has not happened in the past that skipping a meeting means we have a longer meeting and I think it, redistricting we can handle in a couple different ways. So if we are going to take a summer break preference for July versus August for anyone on the commission. The only preference I have is around the future agenda item that I wanted to raise, um, which I do has think has a little bit of timeliness, though I don't I don't think there's going to be that much that changes. So I would maybe lean more toward a July over August meeting having July, okay. mm -hmm. but, but I also can go if, if everyone else cares about August. I really don't care. Commissioner Bernholtz. Anything that's better for your schedule. Uh, not a strong preference, but I would prefer to skip August. Okay. I'm hearing 2 votes for skipping August if we end up skipping 1, so. Uh, We'll keep that in mind and plan to have July. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other future agenda items that I've not mentioned? 
<laughs> well, <laughs> I feel very swayed. <laughs> um, yes. Yes. Um, so I wanted to go back to my comment about racial equity, which was um, miss uh, mismentioned in a previous agenda item. Um, and there are a few key components of that that I want us to both revisit and explore. The first being the conversation around land acknowledgements. Um, I'd love to um, perhaps reach out to Commissioner um, Bernholz to get a little bit more insight into the previous conversations around that, as I believe we talked about that a couple of meetings ago, um, and understand where that kind of ended. Um, and then the second piece is looking at um, not only the racial equity report for the elections department, but also for our own commission in our potential letter to the appointing authorities of our commission for the seats that are vacant, um, specifically the mayor's office and the school board, though I know that seat's been vacant for quite a while. Um, I think we are, I think we need to be I think it's important to me that we as a commission consider our own roles in whether or not we do represent the true public of San Francisco. And we did receive that feedback from members of the public in multiple meetings. Um, and so I'd like for us to just have a conversation around that. Um, and also talking about kind of the specific priorities around how we can ensure that we're looking at policies from a racial equity lens as well. All right, add into the agenda. Uh, any other thoughts? Yes, yeah, so there was an item I mentioned at the last meeting, which was um, having a topic about sole source contracts. And this is a, there's a contract that the department mm -hmm. signed last um, September, a little less than a year ago, and um, for a little bit less than $2 million. And it's something that I don't think we really um, had a chance to discuss or I don't think it was listed in the budget or anything like that. So I just wanted to have an item on that contract and just more generally about sole source contracts. Is there a timing sensitivity to that item? Just so I um, well, I guess not. Um, I'm just trying to. Oh, no, there's no time sensitivity. No. Cool. Okay. Uh, unless there's any other items. Public comment. Sorry. I, I do we take public comment on this one? I think so. We do. I oh I do see a hand raised. Mm -hmm. Um I'm still here, David Philco. <laughs> um so if you're making a, a list of things, I would um add to that uh review of the uh, June election plan and at some point a review of uh, the November election plan, which I'm sure has not yet been written. Although maybe the director wrote it during the meeting tonight in his spare time. Um, on uh, Vice President Chertonik's, uh suggestion about sole source contracts, uh, perhaps the city attorney could also uh, give you some uh, attention on the behested payments uh, legislation and how that now affects uh, contracting uh, in the city and with departments. You might want to incorporate that in the discussion. And just finally, I believe the commission uh, reviewed the director's performance uh, in closed session a few months back. I can't remember exactly when, but I don't recall that the commission secretary has been reviewed. And I believe she's been uh, in office for more than a year. And I think having an annual performance evaluation of your commission secretary it might be helpful um, for all concerned. I, I'm not looking to get rid of anybody. I just think having a, a you know, a annual performance evaluation of your two appointees is um, a thing to do. So those are my suggestions for the list. Thanks for listening. Uh, I don't think there's any other callers. No so. Callers. It is 9.24 p.m. and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Great job, guys.